We are live. Good evening, everyone. Paolo is Hello. telling us about reading a webcomic. Unshelved? Unshelved. Unshelved. By, yeah, by Bill Bill Embaum, Embaum and Bill Burns. Gene Embaum oh. and Bill Burns. Okay. I read certain web, like instead of reading a newspaper, my, I usually read web comics with my breakfast every morning. Mm. And uh, whoa, what was that one that's in my, uh, oh, all of a sudden I can't remember the name of it. Hold on. Let me look in my other browser. It's, um, uh, what was the name? I can't, I read it every morning. I can't remember the name. <laughs> I can't remember uh, the name of the woman who does it. Web, let's see, webcom girls with slingshots. That's it. Oh yeah, I remember that. I used to read that. And it's it's once again, it's it's not being made new anymore. Hmm. But she's now reposting it for the third time, and I'm just rereading it for the third time because <laughs> I haven't read it. You know, there was been because. First, she ran, I think she's got a Patreon now that she does other comic stuff on. Um, what was her name? Let me, hold on, let me find her name here for a second. Her name was uh, da, 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 Old Duns. Girls with Slingshots by, come on, what's her name? Danielle Corsetto. Corsetto, yeah. There we go. And it's funny because I found her webcomic through Etsy. Mm. Because at one point she was selling art at Etsy. And I was just happened to be looking on Etsy. And I saw a watercolor drawing of hers that I really liked. And I ended up buying. And then when I got it, of course, she had her card in it for her. Um, howdy. Good evening, sleepy reader. She had a card in it for her web comic, so I started reading it then. So it was like it's funny that I found her comic through her art. Um, but then um I, I think the strip it ran for eight years or something like that, a long time. Originally in black and white. Then she became successful with it. She, you know, sold some books, and so she she decided to quit it and move to Patreon, but then still like ran the comic in repeats uh except she had them colored so they're now the second time through they're now running um for the first time in color girls with slingshots and then like i said like i don't ran for something like eight years i can't a long time and then she, you know, ran through that second time. And she's like, what am I going to do now? Because she's still got it. She's like, oh, I guess I'll just run through it a third time. I was like, good. Sounds good to me. I haven't read them. So, you know, I read one a day. I go on and check it out. So now I've been reading it through for the third time. Just because, you know, it's something I do at breakfast. I check out my web comics, see what's there, and read them. I haven't found any new ones in a while to read, though. I'll have to look. I don't know. If Web comics are still really uh, how many are out there? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, not it, it used to be easier to find web comics because there yeah. was a, a time when they had guest strips, yeah, yeah. So you'd see one there were a lot of them in like yeah. I don't know the what? third or fourth year of her strip, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I remember Danielle did a, something on what the. Uh, I can't remember the name of the other thing. Hard week. I'm glad it's Comic Friday Night Live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good evening, Wilson. How are you doing? I'm oh, doing okay. Getting... I just can't okay. hear anything yet. Ah, all right. He's got to hear us. Did you have fun watching the eclipse? Done watching the eclipse. Had a fun time <laughs> watching the eclipse. Had some eclipse glasses. It looked cool. Managed to get a couple of eclipse photos through the glasses. <laughs> and uh, I was at school that day teaching, and they had a break and an eclipse party up on the sixth floor where they had big windows where we could see it. Then we went down outside to 14th Street to... Uh, Check out the change in light with the eclipse. 
had a fun time. This was yeah, like, this was too late for us to, uh, to be able to. Uh, but I think we we're supposed to have a a partial solar eclipse in 2026 or 27. Okay. Yeah, I think they said our next one here is 2044. So it's another 20 years. <laughs> Let's see. I assume Wednesday comics became so af- oversaturated that they lost their effectiveness in finding an audience. Yeah. There were there was a time when everybody and their mom were was were doing a web comic. Yeah. Yeah, there was, and there's, there's, I, at least I don't run into them as much anymore. There's still the successful ones are still out there. Yeah. Just I like the age of, bl- I still have, a, I still have a blog and web comic. Though the long, the age of blogs and web comics is long over. <laughs> is Penny Arcade still around? What was that? Penny Arcade. I think that's still around. Yeah. Yeah, that was the one that everyone copied because uh, right, that was like, the like uh, big successful one. Yeah, because in, in a couple of months, then we had two hundred new web comics about gamers. Yeah, yeah. And there was something every comic, every new comic that I that I found used to have a cute little something that was anthropomorphic. Yeah. Uh, like in Girls in Slingshots, it's the cactus. The right, the cactus <laughs> plant in her house, right? And yeah, there was lots of, lots of them. One had a sloth. What comic had the sloth? I don't remember the sloth. There was a sl- uh, there was one that cro- crossed over with uh, Girls with Slingshots because that's how I know the sloth and I recognized it. But since once again Sleepy is here, uh, Sleepy Reader is here early. I wanted to talk about this. Is one of the comics that I got this week. Mm-hmm. Let me show it to you. This hard to read. The principles of necromancy. And there's lots of dead bodies there. And I liked the art in it. And um, there we go. This is the the play, the doctor, Dr. Eyes, Dr. Jacob Eyes. And I think this came out last week. And um, I saw, you know, Sleepy, Sleepy Reader had it on his weekly roundup. And, and it was, he, he, um, he found like the gratuitous violence a little too over the top for him. But I saw, I was like, you know, no, maybe I'm in the mood for gratuitous violence when I saw it in the shop this week because I only had, had like three comics on my pull list this week, so I ended up pulling two off the shelf. Um, test, test, test. Ramos Comics is testing. <laughs> bloody, bloody comic. It was. I ended up enjoying it. A lot. And I think part of the reason I enjoyed it a lot was I knew it. I knew what was coming. I knew kind of knew what it was. And uh, I knew it was kind of over the top. So go. I think knowing that going in made me enjoy it more. And um, though it's nothing like it kind of in tone, the thing it reminded me most of was Ice Cream Man. Because um, though I think it, it's a continuing series from what is this Magma Comics by um, uh, the writers are Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly, and the artist is the uh, Kamon Winkle C A M O N. I w- I wanted to say Cameron, but it's just come on. At least I think that's a C. Yeah, it is. There's another. No, no, it's not a C. What is that? Is that an E E A M O N? Look, t- take a look at this crazy lettering. Uh, Eamon. E- so it's Eamon, right? Because that C yeah. above it in Colin is a C. No, that's a, yeah, that's an E. That's an E. That's an E, definitely. Okay, so it's yeah, Eamon, Eamon Winkle. Eamon Winkle, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
I thought it was mostly good, but I didn't find it compelling. <laughs> I think you muted Wilson. No, I think Wilson was having sound problems. Up oh, now he's muted again. Let's see. Is he actually? No, he's not. He's not muted on our end. I think he's muted on his end somehow. But I have to say with this, the reason it reminded me of Ice Cream Man was because uh, it, it was a done-in-one story. Um, at, at least I think this part was. I think the continuing character is this Dr. Jacob Eyes. Because the story, I, I guess you'd call it like a barbarian story. Oh, there's some nice bloody fantasy. I, I don't know if you could quite call it sword and sorcery, but maybe. <laughs> there's, there's no real sorcery in it. The science is the sorcery. Because in the beginning of the story, we have these this like barbarian tribe. And um, they're at war with the city people, who are kind of these knights. And the leader of the barbarian tribe is injured and dying. So his son goes and gets this city doctor, our Dr. Eyes, who's in that weird plague doctor mask, to save his father. And this doctor is, of course, the he's the ice cream man like character in this book. I would get he's he's kind of got the uh, and he saves the he saves the uh father. Um they go do out. They get. They then get the barbarians. Then get their. Um, they, oh, they explicitly say there's no magic. <laughs> okay, I do suspect each issue will be a fresh, gross story starring Doctor Eyes. So I guess the ice cream man comparison is logical. Yeah. Um, so they go out and they they lose. You know, they get their ass kicked by the um, city people in their armor and. So the um, and, and meanwhile the the son is like I just want my father back. We have to win this. I want to win this battle. I want my town to thrive. I want to kill these city people. And so the after they lose the battle, the doctor is like, "Don't worry, I can save them." You know, and he comes back and he saves them. But they're he's saving them kind of by making them like into Frankenstein zombies. And, and the son's like, "Uh, this is a little crazy." He's like, "Now, now, we'll win the battle. Now, you'll win the battle. Now." So the city people come in their armor and they fight again and the barbarians lose the battle. Um, yes. And our doc, Dr. Eyes's buttons. I, I mean, Dr. I, he's, I don't know what they are supposed to be. Those are his eyes. So, you know, there's something weird going on because he's got these crazy button eyes. Um, so then they lose the second battle. And Dr. Eyes is like, to, says to the son, now, don't worry, I'm going to save you. You're going to win the battle. He's like, what? And so the doctor, instead of turning them all into like zombie Frankensteins, turns them all into this giant monster who, with the son as sort of the head of it, here's this, here's what he makes out of them. He turns them all into this, there's, there's the dude's head, the son's head in the middle. He turns them into this thing and wins the battle. And the son's like, crap, crap. I guess uh, Wilson's restarting. The son's like, crap, crap. We won the battle, but everybody's dead. Everybody in his side was dead. Everybody in the other side was dead. And um, th there's one point where he says something like, um, like the the only guy left is that son who's attracted this giant model. Yeah. But and 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 meanwhile the you know the doctor is walking away going, don't worry, you're probably immortal in that form. You'll live forever. I don't think anything can kill you. And the son's just like, what? Crap. So it's like the son's left this monster in this monstrous form. And the doctor says, like, yeah, I'm going to move on to the next town now. So that's what makes me think it's like Ice Cream Man. We get another story next. Um, yeah, so I was trying to say certainly. Yeah, that like, like the sun's just a wreck. At the, that's just his head on top of that giant monster. And, he, and he's crying, of course, because he got what he wanted, but not really.
Um, yep, he's trying to restart. I've never even heard a whisper of that publisher before. Wonder if it's really self-published. I don't know. There, I have not either. Magma, and it says in the back, uh, they say comics will break your heart, but it will also mend your soul. The best stories have a power that we need to do better for the people creating them. This brings us to Magma Comics. Our vision is to tell extraordinary stories that move and entertain mature audiences across the globe. To accomplish this, Magma is committed to empowering creators with their freedom and support. And isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's just welcome to the melting pot. But in the Indicia, um, the principles of necromancy are copyright uh, Ego Death Incorporated and Eamon Winkle. So I guess I guess the writers incorporated and own part of it with Ian Winkle, who is not incorporated. So it's not mm-hmm. it's not Magma Comics own. So I guess it's creator own stuff. But like I said, I enjoyed it, but I, but I think part of the reason I enjoyed it was I knew what it was going in. Having seen Sleepy's review, I knew it was kind of going to be bloody and over the top. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm in the mood for bloody and over the top. Yeah, the next the next issue cover looks like yeah new yeah I think it is. Do they give us the yeah? It's like a little girl reading a book with the plague doctor the doctor eyes above her. So I think I think like Ice Cream Man is a new story. Good evening, Missing hey. Mars. We're waiting for Paolo to come. I mean, we're waiting for Wilson to come back. <laughs> He's been having some problems with his sound. But yeah, I I, I enjoyed that. I, I got to say that one was uh, pretty cool. Whoever these people are. Eamon Winkle. Yeah, I can. That There's a font I can read on the top there. <laughs> <laughs> Yemen Winkle. <laughs> ah, friend. My my week, my sense of time this week was all messed up because I had to go into the city on Thursday to cover a class. Mm. So it was like I got home Thursday night and I was like, it's Thursday, not Wednesday. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> usually I'm only going to the city two days a week. Mm-hmm. And I was getting out a comic for bad idea the whole week, too. That a children's book comic that they're bringing that's not really a children's book that they're bringing to whatever con is coming up i forget which one is next uh part of their tankers series glad you enjoyed it bloody jared yeah i enjoyed like i think part of the reason i enjoyed it was i knew what was coming thanks to sleepy's review if it had taken me by surprise, I don't know, you know, if I would have enjoyed it. Sometimes it's not the comic, it's the mood you're in. That happens. Mm-hmm. Have you ever liked a comic you read later better than you liked it earlier? Uh, I guess. I have to retry air, airtight garage because uh, the, the first yeah. time <laughs> I, w- I was really confused. Uh, yeah, so we probably should go after some some of the Mobius stuff that I, that I found too. I, I much prefer to be surprised and like a comic rather than me going eh. Is that that happened to me? You speaking of airtight garage with the Inkle. Mm-hmm. Uh, first time I read the Inkle, I was a little disappointed by it. I didn't find it terribly interesting. Uh, and then, of course, I didn't read it for a decade at least. And then I said, you know what? Let me give this a try again. Who knows? Maybe, you know, <laughs> the time I read it, I was a little disappointed by it. Yeah. I didn't think, you know, the artwork is terrific, of course, but. Yeah. The s- uh, story I think just I'm, I, may be, I may be more in the mood to dig into Corto Maltese nowadays than, I, than when yeah. I was younger because that. I was I was I always was a bit bored uh, uh, by by it, which is kind of funny considering that uh, our reverential European comics fans are towards anything made by Hugo Pratt. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was always more. <laughs> I'm one of the few people on the planet who think Manara is Milo Manara is better than than Pratt. Yeah. 
the sleepy there's says new, uh, they're doing new, new corto maltese stories nowadays but they're not in the same style ah uh, they decided to because they're doing the same with lucky luke which doesn't which it's kind of weird but it, it works in lucky luke because it's humorous so when it, when they try to do something like young corto maltese in a in a in a, in, in, in a japanese style and it's not even current japanese style it's like when in the style of, of lupin third the that old anime yep i remember that one <laughs> hudson hawk is basically a live action lupin the third movie yeah if you've never seen that yeah <laughs> And Sleepy Reader says, I like Transmetropolitan trans better a second time trying. First time I thought it would be like planetary. I actually, um, I want to try reading Transmetropolitan again too, because I actually read it before planetary. Well, I shouldn't say I read it. I read an issue or two of it. And um, I found it too smarmy. There was something about it that put me off. But I, yeah, but I read that it in the was 90s. Typical of Warren, yeah, but that, that was still typical of Warren Ellis main characters at, at the time, because they they had to be small, a smart Alex. Yeah, yeah, it was like the smart Alex, but that that was like the beginning of Warren Ellis. So mm -hmm. and that that may have been like the second or third thing I read by Warren Ellis. It was like before Stormwatch and everything, I think. And um, but like there was just something a little smarmy about it, a little that. I only read it, but I've always wanted to go back and read it again because I've become a big Warren Ellis fan. And Derek Robertson drew it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who I like too. I'm like, you know what? I, sh I should go back and read that. I read it but as I it came have... out, which is kind of stupid because it's a series that I now wanted to have in collected, in collected form. Yeah. Is uh, it in print? Especially because... Oh yeah, it still is. Uh, amazingly, okay. give, given uh, what DCS uh, did to to Vertigo, yeah, they, they still have it in print. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right, maybe in five years' time, they decide they don't want to renew it or something. Uh, but Transmetropolitan is the the is the first series that was created that was written for the trade. Ah, okay. Six arc, six issue arcs, everything. Right. Yeah, that's one I definitely want to check out again, just because, um, like I said, there was something about it that didn't... But, you know, that was, what is this, uh, nearly 30 years ago, <laughs> like 25 years ago, I probably read a couple issues of it. And sometimes it's just like, you know, I could have just not been in the mood for it, too. It took me six to eight issues to accept the attitude in Transmetropolitan. Its inventiveness won me over. Oh, okay. See, like, I, I didn't even try to read six to eight issues. I read one or two and was like, eh. But I also, it was really hard. It's really hard for a Vertigo comic to win me over. Hmm. I've just never been a huge Vertigo fan. So I think that had something to do with it, too. Well, even though, didn't that start out under a different imprint? Was that like it's science fiction? Yeah, imprint? yeah. Remember Helix, Helix or something? Helix, yeah, and Helix then it moved Helix. to Vertigo after Helix died really quick. Yeah. yeah. Well, Helix came out at at the wrong time because it was 1996. <laughs> yeah. Total random question. Favorite beverage? Water. Total boring Irish answer. Irish whiskey. I don't like anything to drink but water. Maybe some milk. I don't drink 99% of what I drink is just water, water bottle. Well, I'd like, I'd like to say that 99% of what I drink is Irish whiskey, but that would not, that would not be good. <laughs> a, a really, uh, I don't know why, but I don't like anything sweet to drink. Mm. I like sweets, puts, put sugar in my water and I hate it. I never like. I don't like anything carbonated. I've I've never never liked soda. Don't drink coffee. Nothing but water. <laughs> coffee and water all day. Beer at night. I've never. I've been a teetotaler my whole life. Well, so I don't drink a, beer and hung out in plenty of bars drink. plenty of times. But <laughs> co co coffee doesn't count as a drink. Coffee is something that you drink in fifteen seconds. 
<laughs> sure, maybe that European coffee. No, it's not European <laughs> coffee. There are two. There are only two countries in the world who know how to make coffee. Portugal is one. Ah, uh, okay. Is, the other one is Italy. Nobody Italy. else on the planet knows how to make coffee. <laughs> Philistines. There, there was a, one thing that I that I changed in my coffee habits because uh, when you start drinking coffee, you put sugar put sugar in it. Then yeah. one day you decide to cut, you, you decide to cut, uh, to cut sugar just to find out what it's like. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, this thing is bitter. But you do it again mm -hmm. the next day. In in a week, you barely register. In two <laughs> weeks, you you there will be one day that you forgot that you no longer take sugar on, on your coffee. <laughs> and you and you'll put it, put it in by accident, and then you'll drink. Ah. It. Oh, this is not coffee. This is sugar. No, Paolo is sugar. indeed a coffee snob. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, yes, uh, espresso is the only acceptable form of coffee. Yeah, so much that, we call that water is probably why you're as healthy as you are, Judge. Probably, mm -hmm. I would probably be twenty pounds heavier if I was if I didn't just drink water, just like everybody else in, in the U.S. of A. who drinks sugar drinks all day because that's like hundreds of calories a day people have just in their drinks. Yeah, being from Southern Europe, of course, I drink wine with every meal. Ah, only we could all move to Portugal. Yes. <laughs> We'd have a good time. Although housing, the housing market is through the roof. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Let's let's just say that if I wanted to move to move right now, it's a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> you have a house, keep it. And speaking of things that um, I like better now that I've reread them a second time, I just reread this. The New Deal by Jonathan Case. I barely know who this guy is. Um, he hasn't done a lot. He's done. A, I think he's done some Batman sixty six work. When when did this come out? Twenty fifteen. I probably got it around then and read it. And the drawing is just so good. But I wasn't a fan of the story this time around. I was more of a fan of the story. But let me show you some of this art. This this is one of these guys who I'm like it. Uh, I love his art so much mm -hmm. that I'm just like, wow, this guy is really good. And he hasn't done a lot. Where's the stuff at the end that was really cool? There we go. I love this dress. Takes place, I think, in the 30s. Mm -hmm. In a hotel in New York City, but no, we just don't have, we don't have mind the comics here, so we can check the the buttons. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was thinking of that as I read it. I was like, this guy does some pretty good suits. I wonder if mind the comics would approve of them. But just some terrific cartooning, some terrific drawing. His ink work is terrific. His black and white balances. There's some old cars for you. Mm -hmm. Beckard's um, and I gotta say, I uh, this is one of the I, I I really like his drawing. It, it it's rare that I read a comic and I'm like, wow, I wish I could draw like that. But he's one of the guys I go, wow, I wish I could draw like that. Um, and it's a story that uh, takes place in a hotel in New York City in, I think, the 30s. I can't remember what year it is. 19, New York City, 1936. And there's like a bus boy and a, um, a maid who are the two main characters. And there, meanwhile, there's the various rich people and there's a thief. Someone is stealing stuff, which, well, of course, they're blaming it on the maid and the bus boy. But uh, really, I, I enjoyed the story a lot better the second time around. I enjoyed the artwork a whole lot the first time around, too. But this, and it's a Dark Horse original graphic novel. I wish this guy's done more stuff.
I, I looked up his latest stuff and he was doing like some children's book stuff. Like I said, he, he's he got a few issues of Batman 66 under his belt, but he is really good. And he's an Eisner Award 62. winner. Oh, Green River Killer. Blues. What was that? Yeah, 62 Lefty Blues is recommending uh, Green River Killer. Yeah, I, th I think I've heard of that one before. Um, oh, yeah, ba yeah, Batman 66. I love Jonathan Case. I am reading uh, Green River Killer he did for Dark Horse. Yeah, I want to get that one since I just saw it. Hey, hey, Lefty. Dear Creature is one of the uh, others that is good, too, both in black and white. Wow. Saying hello to Damien. He has a Paul Pope-ish style with some Samney in it. I think more Samney than Paul Pope, because I think Paul, Paul Pope has a lot of spontaneity in his actual brushwork. His, his, his brush, though he's got a lot of sort of like, you know, he's got a lot of good um, movement in his figures and a lot of sort of good caricature to his he, he's a good cartoonist as well as a good uh sort of graphic designer illustrator so i i think i think the paul pope you're seeing in him is like the cartoonishness the way he has the figures moving and because paul pope is good at that but yeah very really i like his like his art i, I think i want to get the green river killer and i'll see if i can track that one down but just really, really wish he had done more stuff. I mean, I don't know. How old is he, I wonder? Let's see. They got a picture of him in the back. That's him. Doesn't look that old in 2015, maybe in his 20s. Says, what does it say? John, oh, Eisner award-winning cartoonist. The work includes graphic novels, prose, and paintings. So he may be doing other stuff. Uh, Dear Creature, Tor, 2001, was his first. Followed by Green River Killer, Dark Horse, and Batman 66 in 2013. Jonathan has dozens of paintings and murals throughout Portland hotspots. The, in 2015, the city's TEDx event honored him as their featured artist. He lives in Portland with his wife, Sarah, and their children, Dorothy and Otis. So is a Portland, Ohio guy. Keep Portland weird. But yeah, I really enjoyed rereading this one. The New Deal. A lot of fun. His, his work looks very different in color just on this cover than it does even in black and white on the back because his, his like black and white graphic design is so strong. That the color kind of mutes it. Interesting. Interesting. That was a good one. I saw on TikTok that Wilson got back from the... Uh-oh. Uh Wil Wilson's got the best vid quality. Jared the worst. Uh-oh. Which is terrible today. Which is odd because I, I have a bad internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> I, my vid quality seems fine to me on my end, but who can tell? Uh, yes, I did stop by the comic book shop. I went to Jim um, Midtown Comics today. He wants to say Jim Hanley's picked up, <laughs> picked up a bunch of books because I I'm so used to saying that I was I would yeah. go to Jim Hanley's because I went there for so many years that it's kind of like right, in my right. mind that's the default comic book shop when it isn't. So uh, yeah, so I picked up some books, um, at least two. This week's and last week's books from my pull list, and then a few books off the shelf. So from the pull uh, list... Portland is not weird anymore, says Sleepy Reader. Uh-oh. That's right. You're in too, Portland, aren't you, Sleepy? It could be my <laughs> So <clears throat> King Kong, The Great War. I'm King. Let's go big so we can see you. King uh, Kong, The Great War. King Kong, The Great War. Issue I am so behind five? on this book i have no idea what's going on uh i believe it's dynamite entertainment and uh i was not aware of this at the time but king kong is in the public domain to a certain extent at least the book is uh -huh. so there are quite a few different king kong projects going on or yep. like the godzilla versus kong is just kong they don't call him king at all okay. so i'm wondering if that has 
anything to do with it. But it's some good looking artwork. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. I can't do a review because I don't know what's going on. So I need to get the. How um, many issues have you read so far? Well, this have is you started it? five. I right. don't recall if I did. Because I may have started it like on issue two, and I wanted uh, to grab issue one and then put them together, but I haven't found it. And even the comic book shop guy was like, "How is this book?" And it's like, I have no idea. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've been liking the I've been liking the artwork. I do recall right. skimming through it and enjoying yeah. the look of the artwork. And let's see, let's give credit to credits due. The art is by uh, Tommaso. Bacini, but Bunchy. Let's see. We show it here so we get a proper me, look to we'll it. Make it bigger so we can see. Tommaso Bianchi. 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 Matt Idelson is the editor, huh? Yeah. Former Marvel guy in DC. And this is based on King Kong of Skull Island. So that was okay. a book that came out, I think, in hardcover a few years back. That was a beautiful looking book. Uh, I, all I remember is the cover was a painted cover on it. So I I recall seeing it. And there's some great imagery in it. Yep. So again, to me, it's like I've been picking them up, but I haven't sat down to read it. So that was last week's books. Uh, to continue from last week's books, we have Savage Dragon number two sixty nine. Yep, that was a good one. I'm really <laughs> digging this back cover image. Oh yeah, that's cool. That's the one where the the, the fish squad okay. attacks. <laughs> Looks like it. Okay, yeah. it doesn't look like there's much nudity on this one. So here you <laughs> go. <laughs> Except for that corner Spider Woman who's um, shooting her webs out of her butt. Oh. The vicious fishes. That well, was it, yeah. Right? Vicious fishes. The vicious awesome. fishes. Yeah. So those are the, those are from last week's. And then this week we have Amazing Spider Man and Thundercats. Okay. Spider Man, I actually read. I read it on the train. And even though it's not John Romita Jr. doing the interior artwork, it was a pretty good looking book. So I okay. liked it. Um, so they're done with the, the, the New York War. war. So oh, the gang war's to, over? Like, we don't get a regular. Map? The gang war is over. There's no map in this one. Uh, it's not a map book. And anymore. what is funny, story-wise, it ends with this part where it's like, oh, no, not you. Okay. Dear God, not you. And you turn the page, and it's an ad for a wedding issue. Of <laughs> <X -Men>. <laughs> 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 so, oh, no, another event. <laughs> uh, Zeb Wells, the writer. Todd Knock is the guest uh, artist. Okay, I know his name. I think I've seen his work. Book. He's pretty good. I've seen him before. I've seen him before on Spider Man. So I enjoy his work. It's right. uh, it's that cartoony style, but it works for Spider Man. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you recognize the characters pretty easily. So I did enjoy this issue. Uh, Aunt Anna. Set up Peter on a blind date with um, a nurse, huh. so that was an interesting thing. And uh, you know, in the middle of the date, wackiness ensues. Betty Brant is uh, in danger, and I they, there is. I thought they brought Mary Jane back to be his love interest. She's back, but I think she's still living with that guy that was uh, the 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 father of those two kids when she was uh, stuck in that alternate dimension. So as far as I'm aware of, they're not together currently. Mm -hmm. And then Thundercats, I actually read this issue on the train. Thunder, as I mentioned Thunder. before, it's a nice Chitara cover. 
I don't think I could name before. a Thundercat. <laughs> Not at all? Okay, so... Uh, well, you didn't watch it. That was no, I didn't too watch old for it. You, at the time. I mean, you were too old for it at the time. Yeah. Well, the artwork's fine. I'm still not digging the story altogether, nor the designs of the Thundercats. Right. Uh, just because there are some differences that I, I really don't understand why they went with it. I don't mind the artwork. The artwork is fine. The lettering is great. Uh, the, the character coloring design, is fine. Right? It's just a character. There is no reason why he should have that kind of a mustache. Right. I remember you saying no that last sense. week. sense. That makes no sense to me. Uh, I did find, though, as I was reading it, I liked it a little better than the previous issues. Okay. And to me, Panthro had his voice. Or that was at least a voice in my head that matched the cartoon. So was I was fine with it. Was Thundercats the one Kirby did a lot of the? What am I thinking of? Something in the early eighties. You're no, probably thinking of Thundar the Barbarian. Thundar the yeah. Barbarian, and that might be what I'm thinking of, right? Thundar yeah. Yeah. Thundercats was later than that. Yeah, Thundercats was eighty four, eighty seven. Because because I, I remember it was definitely after Thundar. Right, because I can remember Thundar the Barbarian. Like, I was in high school, I think, when Thundar the Barbarian. And there was, like, some kids watching it in high school. They were like, oh, this one's cool. Yeah, and after Thundar, Kirby did, did designs on, on Centurions. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's Thundar the Power Barbarian. I think I'm thinking, yeah. Power Extreme, yeah. <laughs> all, of the, all of the best issue... cartoons in the 80s were toy tie-ins. Oh yeah, completely. That was it, it, it was why it existed. And this issue, issue number 3, seems to only have 3 pages of or uh no, the, of the covers. These two pages here of the covers and then the wow. third page of covers. So not as many as before. Wow. And I was not aware of it, but it looks like Dynamite Entertainment has the license for Johnny Quest. Oh, okay. I didn't know that either. And Space and Space Ghost. I've I've so seen I, think the, I may pick them up. Space Ghost number I'm one is out. Charleston looking cover. Is it? Right. I did not see yeah. that on the stands. I, I know I saw Space Ghost on the stands a week or two ago. Uh because I picked it up and, and put I it see. back. Uh, I think I would get this or one. Or maybe maybe it's, it's not Charleston out. Maybe I saw it on the final order cutoff. I game. don't remember. What was that? Uh, oh. I may get this one because it has okay. that gold key Charleston. Ah. I'm trying to remember which one. I think gold key. Yeah, and it says May. So. Yeah, maybe I saw it on final order cutoff. That was it. And I was like, eh, I don't want to order it. So it might not be out then. But I definitely haven't seen Johnny Quest on final order cutoff yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't even seen anything of Johnny Quest. So it's like, okay, I'm wondering what they'll do with it. Uh, sometimes they're hit or miss. When Dynamite did Mighty Mouse, that was a complete miss. <laughs> I, I never hated a book more than that. And I usually like any book I get, but that book was just so bad. The the IDW catalog you got with the... Um... Ah. Turtles and Usagi Yojimbo. Did that did that have random slices of pizza on it? I was just like, I you I saw it on uh your TikTok. And I'm like, yeah, I think there's just there's just random slices of pizza on that cover. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. They threw a pizza up in the air and he just they just cut it up, but it's just pizza <laughs> flying around. It's just pizza. And a great for no ad particular for... reason. For issue 150, I guess this is where that story ends. Yeah. But what a nice looking image. Yeah, cool. I was thinking about buying the, issue 150. <laughs> yeah, just I'm because. thinking about it as well. And I just saw yeah, an, the IDW an was really cool book. Mm -hmm. I just saw an announcement today. I don't I don't know how true this is that they're supposedly doing a new turtles movie that's going to be dark based on the last Ronin turtle. What story. I understand, I heard that as well that they're doing a live action version of that story. And you know, why not? It's popular. Yeah. You know, they Tip made Goblin action said, figures for it. Uh, Thundar was 1980, Thundercats was 85. Okay, that's why I know nothing about Thundercats. 
<laughs> I was in college and not paying attention to Thundercats. Thundar, I, I think that came out, that would have been like my first year of high school. Um, and I'd like to, I remember people being into it. And I remember finding out that Kirby had something to do with the design. I don't think it lasted very long. Maybe two seasons, Thundar lasted? It lasted I, I believe it lasted one season. One season even. Wow. I, I believe so. I, I have to look at it. It's been a while since I did a like a deep dive into Thundar. Yeah. But uh, you know, the year is 1999, and the comet came between Earth and the moon, and it split the moon in half, and, ah. and wackiness ensued. <laughs> <laughs> split the moon in half. Uh, and we should mention uh, Trina Robbins died this week. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, Paolo, you said you, you've not even heard of her before, haven't you? No, no, I, I only mm -hmm. noticed the day after the announcement. Oh, okay. Uh, that she had died. Because I was, uh, I, I was contemplating Trina Robbins going. You know, what? I really, because on my laptop, my desktop screen, I I stream from my laptop, and on my desktop screen is like a little. Uh, someone posted an, an article called Vulture dot from Vulture dot com that said the story of Trina Robbins the controversial feminist who revolutionized comics. And I was like, I don't remember her revolutionizing comics. And I was trying to, th like, um, to me, I'm like, did I, I don't know when, I've always known who Trina Robbins is. But I've never seen a lot of Trina Robbins comics. Like, to me, um, I don't know if she was big in the 70s when I was a kid. But, like, I know her from stuff like this. Women's Comics. Which was an anthology. Uh, he, which one? Nope, this one is her cover. Which was an anthology from Renegade Press in the 80s. And I knew her most, this is one of her covers, and I knew her mostly from anthology stuff. And I know she was always trying to get more more women making comics and more comics for girls. But I don't know how successful she was at that. Uh, but in, and, and this kind of underground comic stuff is this women's comic stuff. So I don't know if she was big in the undergrounds in the 70s. Because she's one of those people... I've always heard of, but if I were to, you know, I if I were to like recommend Trina Robbins' work to anyone, I wouldn't know what to recommend. Uh, I know she's done some Wonder Woman stuff. Yeah, Trina was very outspoken publicly about women in comics. Maybe that's what they really meant. I think. So. I mean, yeah, that's. But I always had a. It's it's weird. I I I I always have a um, weird relationship with women in comics, only because when I was growing up, if women found out you liked comics, you'd be ostracized by them. I mean, the the easy the easiest way to drive women away was to, to, for them to find out you liked comics. Uh, so whenever I hear this, we need more women in comics. We need more comics for women. I'm always kind of like. Really? The the ones who no longer would talk to you if you, they found out you liked comics? So I always found that a little strange. You know, I, I mean, I, I understand where she's coming from. I, you know, but I always found that a little weird because me personally, every, every, but every comic fan I knew did their best to not let women know they were comics fans. <laughs> that was true for me until high school. But because it was an art high school, there were some of the women there reading comics. So uh, what I, I had was reading X Men, and one of the girls came in, and we had a great cop. My high school, yeah, we had a great conversation just one day of just talking about X Men books. Uh, here like, we go. It was a great conversation. I know her from the seventies. She was part of the National Lampoon group of artists. Ah, okay. I recently picked up a Wonder Woman miniseries. She did, yeah. I think she was probably you, she must have been her most influential in the seventies. A few years ago, the, somebody re reprinted a, an edit, a sex rumor adaptation that, that that she had done, and I was kind of interested in that, but then ended up not, not having the chance to buy it. 
Sax Romer's Dope. Yeah. That I'd always heard of that too. Like growing up, and I never saw it. Like in all of the 80s, I heard of it. <laughs> now it's certain women pushing men out of comics. Yeah, that happens. That welcome to the age of social media. You, you don't have to be pushed out of anything if you don't want it. Uh, he's talking about he's talking about it Discord. <laughs> Nobody can be, being that the vast majority of people who are in comics aren't actually in comics, you don't have to be pushed out. You're already out. I'm already out. I make comics nobody ever <laughs> sees. And that's the vast majority of people making comics. That we make comics that nobody ever sees. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, 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 you know, Trina Robbins, and like she's one of those people who I've always known of, but have never known her work a whole lot. I mean, has she? Right. I mean, I, I can't tell you what she's done in the last 20 years. I'm not sure. <laughs> So it's so it's a little no, strip, but like it, I always I don't know. I always found her stuff in this, uh, you know, anthologies and stuff, especially. So that's where I know her work from, and it, and it never particularly stood out to me. I mean, it was fine. So, um, but like, I would like, I would like like a curation book of her work so I could get into it more because her work's not easy to find either. Because it was always here and there and there and there. And like I said, I knew she did that ad adaptation of Sax Romer's Dope in like, you know, 1983, whenever I heard about it, but never could find it. Never saw it anywhere. Yeah, yeah I think her I know fame her originated in Barbie. the underground. Okay. I think Is she it? worked on Barbie. Yeah, I, I remember her doing I Bar being among the Barbies. At least I think I remember her being among the Barbie stuff. It's I like my so, memory is like. Her, did her she do Barbie that. stuff? I, I think she did something called Misty, Mystic, which was a... a contemporary of Crumb. So if she was, if she was in the underground stuff, I missed them. That, that explains because the undergrounds were gone by the time I was grown up enough to read the undergrounds, and they were they were nowhere to be found. I think she did uh, a short-lived series for, uh, which was a, 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 a modern, a modernized version of Millie the Model, called uh -huh. Misty, for Star Comics. Yeah, that was a four-issue series. Look, it's G G G Russo's. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello there, Hello. Man Good Connor did. Yeah. Amanda Connor did Barbie, and so did Anna Marie Cool. How are you tonight, Chris? We're just talking a little Trina Robbins. Do you do you know her work at all? No. I, I was no. just saying that too. I, I I know of her more than I know her work. And we and we were just learning that her. Her fame originated in the undergrounds, so that was a little. And she What's was a national. The deal with Trina? <laughs> so that was a little before a writer. My she did writing for like Go Go, a uh, Go Girl, which was an image comic, and then okay. Go Girl was also in Dark Horse. All right, Go Girl. Wait, are you talking about you Go Girl? No, it just says Go Girl. Oh, okay. Five, uh, Image Comics. This is two thousand, and then two thousand and two, uh, girl, go girl one through three from Dark Horse, and then she was writing a series called Honey West for Moonstone Books. In okay, it was a TV show from the sixties, and I always saw her um, involved with art shows too. Yeah, especially art shows of women in comics. And I think she was head of, um, for a few years, there's some like Women in Comics Collective or something, which was around for a while that she was part of. But yeah, figured we'd talk about her a little because we, like I said, I wish there was some sort of uh, 
collection of her work. So uh, I can read it. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to read these women's. I don't think I've read these since 1987, since they came out. Luckily, I knew right where they were and got them just before the show. <laughs> In 1969, she's listed as the designer for the costume for Vampirellas. Oh, uh, that's right. The Frank for Frank Miller's version of Vampirella in Frank issue Rosetta, one of Vampirella. You mean Frank yeah. Frazetta's? Not Frank Miller. No, Frank Frazetta, Frazetta's uh, Vampirella number one. So it looks like she designed the costume that he ended up drawing. Yeah, that she that string strings and. Uh, <laughs> little patches of fabric costume that's why i got i i know i i knew of that only because over the years people who have uh, accused vampirella of being sexist someone always says well a woman designed her costume <laughs> that was always like the the answer to vampirella is sexist not only that a card carrying feminist yeah <laughs> yeah So goodbye, goodbye, Trina Robbins. Who um, did she die? Yeah, she died this week. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, I. The, the news is only talking about OJ. How how did you do, do? You never go on social media with all your cartoonist friends. It's all that's been talked about for the last few days. Maybe well, OJ almost, would talk yeah. about in the rest of the world. I, I really don't. I really stay off. I, I Sleepy Reader says Warren wouldn't give her a job, but he conned her into designing the suit for free. Yeah. That sounds like the stories I've heard about him. That's how, yeah. <laughs> According to the bio of Warren, I read. Yeah. Didn't want her di didn't want her drawing, but wanted their costume design for that. Welcome to the world of publishing and comic book publishing. Where the publishers are always looking for free work. Yep. Ah, speaking of speaking of uh, costume design, there I, there's been some guy on the um the Marvel method uh board. I can't remember his name. Um, I can't comment on it because you can't comment in the Marvel method group because the mm -hmm. um the admin never uh. uh never hits the button that allows new people to comment because he can't be bothered. <laughs> well, this one guy, <laughs> he's, in, he's insisting that Marvel and John Romita uh, and, and artists through the years have copied that guy who, that fan who won the Foom contest with the Wolverine. Uh -huh. And he, yeah. he's, he's got drawings with circles. I'm like, oh my God, this guy's insane. Yeah, I, 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 I saw that today, and uh, it was like, the the spots from a real Wolverine were changed to the to the places where Wolverines don't have spots. So that's proof that they stole the costume. Yes, yeah. it's just like, dude, you're insane. <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if there's a joke or not. <laughs> He's like, he even... also there there were there were a couple of concepts that look more like the Terminator. So they stole the skeleton, but when when Wolverine first appears. There's no skeleton, right? And there won't right. be for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that me, wasn't even thought of yet. And just the idea that any professional cartoonist, that part of their process would be stealing ideas from fan art, is tells me you don't know any professional artists, because the last thing you want to do is look at fan art. It does not yeah. help. Oh, the, 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 they're doing it just because of Roy Thomas. Because now they st they decided there's no point in doing Stan Lee bashing anymore because the, they've already yeah. retread everything. So now they're doing Roy Thomas bashing. Yeah. But that, that's just not very convincing. I actually posted something on X uh, when... Um, what's his name? The, Occasionally, I comment on the comics tropes guy to the comics tropes guy, 
Um, and I think it had something to do with his. Uh, his were once again. It was he was commenting on, on and I, I once again had a comment. The idea that John Romita has to get ideas from fan art is nuts. It just doesn't happen. Um, and then someone come, someone, someone wrote back. He's like, oh well, the the first cover of Wolverine took that exact pose from the uh, Foom issue, to which I, of course, immediately posted them next to each other and went, not even close. <laughs> Herb Trimpey ne probably never saw that Foom issue. Now, if you want to convince me that Roy Thomas named him Wolverine because of he saw, you know, that, I'll, I'll at least believe that. But uh... <laughs> the fact-stealing fan would be a bad... You just never even think to do it. Fan art I, I is awful. he even saw the artwork. Yeah. And it's like, even you know, if you did, you think nothing of it. Yeah. The guy who shot Dimebag said he stole the songs. People are nuts. Yeah, there is that, too. But at least with a song, you might hear something and it might stick in your subconscious. With fan art, that does not happen. You forget fan art as soon as it's as bad as that art was in that Wolverine fan art contest. You you never think of it. Jared was Roy Thomas bashing. Don't forget Paolo. The man seems to ask for it. Yeah, <laughs> he does seem to ask for it. But this wasn't Roy Thomas. This was like. He was showing the, the the he was showing a sequence from I don't even know it was a modern comic and by modern I mean the last 10, 20 years of like a Wolverine transformation as he healed and he's like that that's what this guy showed in the and then I think it was Patrick Ford pointed out pointed out that transformations have been around for a long time here are some from Kirby <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of nutty to me. And and it also it brings me to the the time I was um where uh, uh Mark Teixeira mm -hmm. was working uh he was up at Marvel in the bullpen hanging out drawing an issue of Punisher and for those who don't know it was a Mike Barron <laughs> Greg Land enough said he doesn't. Hey, he doesn't get any of that stuff from fan art. He goes straight to the porn mags. He knows where the good stuff <laughs> is. <laughs> but um, for those who don't know, Mike Barron, when he writes something, does thumbnails to go with it. Yeah. And I saw Tex over there working, working away. And, and I looked over and I saw this you know, booklet. of He made a little comic book of thumbnails. And I looked at it, and they're terrible. They're awful. And I looked at it, and I went, oh, you know, Tex, do you, what do you do with these? He's like, I never even look at them. He's like, if I have to look at them, the first thing I have to do is get the bad thumbnails out of my head. And that's the way every professional is with fan art. They don't want to look at it in terms of, you know, getting ideas from it. That's nuts. That well, is so think... nuts. It's unbelievably nuts. Yeah, with Baron, he probably thought he was helping. Okay, so this yeah. is where I want the post to go. He thinks he's helping. <laughs> Craig Land, the porn tracer. Hey, but he does a good job of it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not anti Greg Land, except when he fails. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he succeeds. Sometimes he fails. And he especially fails when people can. the The number one rule of um. Photo reference is take your own photo reference. Lots of art, like yeah. um, Alex Maleev uses photo reference all the time, but he takes his own photo reference. And, and matter of fact, the better he's gotten at being a photographer, the better his art has gotten too. And but there's there's no one to say, oh look, here's the People magazine he took this pose from. Here's the porno he took this pose from. Because he's taken all his own photo reference and we never get to see it, and that's fine. And there's some, like, um, you see all the time the stuff from Continuity Studios where, you know, Walter Simonson, Larry Hama, 
whoever else was there in the 70s posing for each other for the shots of the comic book panels. And you see those all the time, but you see they were just using it for reference. You go, oh, yeah, you got that pose. Oh, yeah. But it's not like photorealistic in any way. They were just right. using it for reference. Um, so it's like a different thing than people like with Greg Land, people love to go gotcha, and that means you failed. <laughs> no, the, the, the problem was with that uh House of M promotional shot, oh, with, yeah, with, with Magneto, which was because it he was doing he was a the the entire he was in a mili, uh, military royalty uniform. Mm -hmm. And it was taken from a from an Associated Press photo of the King of Spain. Right. You can't that take your and... photo reference from famous photos. Right. <laughs> Don't do that. That ruined. That, like people love to say, and he would reuse. I've seen you know sites where he reuses his photo reference. They keep showing the same picture keeps showing first it's storm then it's jean gray then it's this woman it's like the same photo it's like stop that oh, oh gee like in the 1950s when every every western artist had to draw a horse and it mm -hmm. was always well what do you expect you have one picture of a horse of course you can use the same one it's like i i like greg land's work on the cross-gen book sojourn but nobody ever shows where he stole the stuff from in sojourn because no one cares so there's no one to uh, to say gotcha in that book. I know he's clearly using photo reference for some of the stuff, but who knows where he got it from? Sleepy says, I need to dig up that issue of Foom. I remember thinking some of the character art was good when I was a kid. It was. I just you know saw it. it was, it's fan art. <laughs> the Greg Land and O-Face is just famous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sleepy Reader says, Lance Porno Star create an uncanny valley as superheroes, st staring at the camera like a bad actor. Yeah, that's when he fails. That's when and, he. And who, who, who was the, the the artist that traced the photo of a singer from the 70s on a Doctor Strange cover? Oh, yes. Here's something that was um, Amy Grant. He I can't remember who it was, but it was from an Amy Grant album, and she sued Marvel yeah. in the early 90s. So they had to do and get rid of that because she didn't want to. She didn't want to be associated with satanic doctors. Yeah, but when people talk about that, oh, this Amy Grant should not have sued. I mean, <laughs> who cares about Amy Grant? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a problem that people have with Greg Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you don't. When you use photo reference, you don't. You generally don't want to use famous photos yeah. unless you're doing something you know like that quasar demi Moore pregnancy photo yeah, yeah but you know. that's a parody right 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 unless you're doing that you, you don't want them to see your photo the, reference the other problem is that if, if greg land is is a regular cover artist on a uh, on one comic you'll start noticing that all of the of the women's faces are the same yeah. They're this, it's not even that he could have he could he could choose different porn actresses, but he goes for the same one. Right. But he he is not a bad artist by any stretch of the imagination. He just gets caught failing, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. When he gets hey, caught you... using famous photos, that's a fail. Yeah, but oh that's how you learn to draw. When you guys yeah. started drawing when you were like four, mm -hmm. what was the first thing that you did? I, I I fired up the VCR and put the porno in just so I no. could draw them. <laughs> no, but you saw <laughs> no, but you saw other drawings and you copied them. Yes, yes. Copied yeah. a Pink Panther cover once. That's how you learn to draw. What are you working on tonight, yes. Chris? Ooh, Spawn. Spawn. There was a new Spawn, Spawn Universe comic out, to, out this week called Rat City, but I didn't buy it because it was that... a $4 first issue. I saw the cover, but I was like, is that just a new character that looks like Spawn? It took me a minute to go, okay, so I guess Spawn is appearing in this book. It's, it's part no of the what Spawn it was about, Universe. I, didn't I don't it know up. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I find the two face covers all look the same. 
yeah, the uh, like Greg Land ones. <laughs> I would draw out of the comic strips. Someone call the Spawn twenty ninety nine. It's Spawn twenty ninety nine. Okay, guess it's a future Spawn thing. Mm. Yeah, they're, but they're not calling it Spawn. No, it uh, no, it's Hell Spawn. I think they're bringing back. Are they bringing back Hell Spawn? The title? I, there, I think there already is a Hell Spawn book. Mm. There's Spawn, Spawn Scorched, Hell Spawn, right? Uh, who's Western Spawn? Gunslinger, and there may be one other, which is the anthology. So I think Hell Spawn is one of the books. So he must be back. I don't. Mm-hmm. I only read the one Spawn book. So, but I was looking at that one, going rats. Ah, and then I was like, four dollars. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he ripped off the Marvel twenty ninety nine plot, Undead Queen King Spawn. Yes, that's another one of them. King Spawn. Mm-hmm. The other how, issue, I, what was that? How is it a rip off of twenty ninety nine? I guess it takes place in the future with all is. future oh. versions of all the characters and so, so oh. cyber cyberpunkish. And I suspect only, that's only that's happened the, once before. It, We've only seen time travel one time, or. We've only seen a future look at something. Creating a whole new comic book and universe based 100 years in the future. Okay? Get with it, Chris. Okay. And that's only ever been explored once. Only one time has ever made a complete line out of turning all their characters 100 years in the future that I know of. What other universe have you heard of that did that? Is it the whole line of books is doing that? Yeah. I don't know if it's it's just one so far. It's one book. Oh. But it, it's supposed to, let me check again. Who knows how many? Sleep. Do you, yeah, it sounds. It sounds you exa- it's, You know what? You're right. It sounds exactly like Marvel 2099. I have no idea. I wasn't the one who said that. If you want to get into arguments <laughs> with the uh, commenters, you go right ahead. Well, it sounded like you were coming at me, <laughs> bro. I wasn't coming at you. I was coming at you because you're talking out of the, your your ass is what you're doing. You're coming at me with your ass. All I said was the first comic to All I said is that Marvel 2099. I hear that tone in your voice. I I know what you're doing. Marvel 2099 is the only time we've ever seen a look at the future. (laughs) Sure, I know what you're doing. I know what trouble you're making. I see that. So sleepy, Prove do you think wrong. it's going down to two ninety nine? Second issue, I'm curious. Okay. Was it a, I, I know it your moves. Okay, right, it's called the, Rat, Rat City. Rat City, right? I don't know why it's called Rat City. <laughs> I hope they're giant rats. That's, that's what they call. That's what they call the section of the city where Spawn hangs out. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's that's an actual uh, name in that's the book like already. Spawn's. That, yeah, that's like Hell's Kitchen for Spawn. Okay, D- does it take place in New York City or where does Spawn take place? Does it take place in this world with our cities or is it like DC with Metropolis and Gotham? I've been reading Spawn er, for like on, three years I, now. I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anyone should be the expert yeah. on spawn, Jared is should be you. Right? Really? you think I know? <laughs> huh. I just checked. Issue two is listed at two ninety nine. All right. All right. So maybe the first issue was double side or something. Right. Maybe I can buy it next week if it's slow. <laughs> just cause... there you go. The another issue I bought. Um, just for the hacker, because I only had three comics, is The Bloody Dozen, A Tale of the Shrouded College. You know, the cover caught my eye. Then I flipped it Good open cover. and liked the artwork. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But what's weird is, first, it's only 20 pages. But then the back is filled with Pencil pages or you know, uncolored art. I think they're pencils. Uh-huh. No, they're ring, you know, the uncolored art. So we get a look at that too, which is pretty cool. 
but uh, and it's by um da, 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 da. uh Charles Sewell writer Alberto Jimenez uh, Albuquerque uh, artist uh Rachel Rosenberg colorist Chris Crank uh, letterer right. I don't think that I've heard of Chris Jimenez. Crank. What was that? that Jimenez? Jimenez. Yeah, not you don't pronounce the J. It's, it sounds right. like it's, an uh, it's, it's, like, it's like Jaime. Alberto Jimenez. Albuquerque. And um, it's a story. First, we get a flashback to Morocco, 1870, where we get introduced to these vampires. Then we flash forward to the future, and we're on a spaceship where these people were just paid to bring these vampires back from the sun. So the vampires were in chain. I guess the vampires from the past were in these chained up coffins close to the sun somehow. And then Hold on these, a second. Is, um, this happening in the, is this happening in the future? It 2099, is. 2099, exactly. Is it 2099? <laughs> At least I think it's the future. It doesn't say it's the future, but there's spaceships. It could be the now, yeah. but they've got spaceships. How, how if there's a flashback? Well, the, the flashback how else are you gives going you to the year. vampires to the sun. You have to do it in the future. You can't do it now. <laughs> the, the flashback gives you a year, 1870. The flash forward does not give you a year. It just says between the sun and the earth, the cuckoo. I guess the cuckoo. You know what? They're just trying. They're just trying. They're being ambiguous deliberately, just to disguise the fact that they're ripping off Marvel twenty ninety nine. And Life Chris, Force. Chris has found his theme for the evening. <laughs> it's to, to, <laughs> Tomb of Dracula twenty ninety nine. Uh oh. Uh oh. Sleepy Reader is wrecking your whole joke. He says it's the present. Yeah. Now they have to explain how they had spaceships in eighteen seventy. No, no, that, that's not the flash forward has the spaceships. The flash back is to 1870. Then they flash but we don't forward. Have spaceships to, now. They got spaceships now. That's the present. So it's not 2099. They're ripping off Buck Yeah, Rogers. okay. So all they did then was they copied Marvel 2099, but instead of it being in the future, it's in the present. I can see right yes. through that. Anybody can, a mile away. <laughs> Sleepy says yes. magical space powered vampires? spaceship. Not kidding. Space vampires is life force, so it's a ripoff of life force. <laughs> you can't have space vampires. Everybody knows that vampires can't go into space. No, the vampires were trapped in space. They're not space vampires. So they're they were Earth like vampires. Anti- so, so that the, they so shot actually, into space, I assume, to keep them out so of the way. So they're actually ripping off the the, the Star Trek movie reboot. <laughs> so then <laughs> we the get these... in space. I forget what the there's something that the enemy of the vampires are called. There's some name for the group, and they're coming to bust up the spaceship, and they're like these robots with hammers. With hammers, because what? Because the whole idea is they're going to bust up the spaceship so it can't fly and bring the vampires back to Earth. With hammers. With hammers. Yes, they're going to bust up the spaceship with hammers. The guy on the spaceship has a gun. So, you know, he's a little better off than a hammer, but I guess I they didn't want to give the robots anything but hammers. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to stop criticizing that comic. That, that comic is amazing. Everything is ridiculous. You have spaceships transporting va- coffin, uh, vampire coffins to the sun in 1870, and then guys, robots with hammers are going after the comics to, to smash them before they come back. And an amazing coverage. <laughs> I you know, you know say, who else had hammers? Uh, hold on. They had spaceships in the past. Paolo was right, says Sleepy Reader. Who else had hammers, Chris? The Thor rights and Thor 2099. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but I, I actually really enjoyed this issue. Not that I necessarily want to put it on my poll list. But it was kind of like, um, you know, the olden days of comics where you could just pick up a random comic. You're like, oh, there's not, there's not, you know, many comics I want to buy this week. Let's p- pick up this random issue of, I don't know, Ghost Rider or Green Arrow or Green Lantern that I don't usually buy. And it was good. It was a good read on its own. Um, 
I'm sure cool stuff came before it and cool stuff were coming after coming after it. But I enjoyed just reading this one issue <laughs> as sort of like a change of pace. Like you said, it was fun. It had space vampires, that had vampires in the past. And I'm not even at first I read it. I first at first, uh, you know, the first page I read, I went, oh, <laughs> vampire. Because I'm not a huge <laughs> vampire fan. But then I got into it and it was fun. It, it, it was a fun read, I have to say. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It's and called, it ended what's the title with, called? Uh, uh, the Bloody Dozen. Vampire 2099? No. Tomb of Dracula 2099. Vampire 2024. It takes place now. Don't you listen to Sleepy Reader at all? It's like you only hear um, what you want to hear, Chris. I'm just saying all this they do is, is they just goblin. tweak the this numbers. The they tweak the, the numbers band. just a little bit, just enough. They tweak them just enough. <laughs> and when the space vampires come back, are they going to morb? Well, hold on. It ends with well, see, here's the problem. We got our three humans who were sent to save the to get these space van who are paid to save these but i think they were coerced into it they really don't want to bring these space vampires back to earth but here they are on the way back and the robots with hammers are coming after them and they're like <laughs> the gaslight lol whoops hold on <laughs> um so now they're coming back and these you know robots with hammers are coming and they're like we're we're humans. We're not going to survive the vacuum of space. These vampires are going to be okay. The robots are going to be okay. We're the ones who are going to die right away. So they're like uh, Jeruso twenty ninety nine <laughs> says sleepy. <laughs> You're from the future. So they're like crap. We have to get into our space. And meanwhile, the vampires are telepathically talking to the humans, going, "Just give us a little blood. We'll save you." We'll save you. Just give us a little blood. We'll turn you into a vampire and you'll be saved. Go ahead. Come on. We'll take care of these robots. Um, and they're like, oh, crap. What are we going to die? So the, the one woman out of the three in the crew is like, all right, you can drain all my blood. Turn me into a vampire. Just save my daughter. Whoever. Your daughter was one of the ones on the ship. Um, and she's like, I'll sacrifice myself. <coughs> to uh you know because the vampires are all skeletal and everything because they've been in space forever but then i think that oh that there's that woman she gets sucked out of the spaceship uh so the vampires can't use her so on the very last page we have all the vampires biting into her daughter So, will the daughter survive? Will the mother survive? Will the whoever that dude is survive? Will the vampires beat the robots? Tune in next. Will the vampires issue. go to twenty ninety nine and stay there? <laughs> well, if you really want to know, just go read Marvel twenty ninety nine. Well, like I said, I had a lot of fun with it. It was it was a fun issue to just pick up and read, which is you know what I you know comics how a lot of us used to read a lot of comics. Yeah. Pick it up and just start reading. <laughs> you don't have to put on your pull list. You don't have to read every issue. You can just read this one issue and it's cool. And it's cool. <laughs> so have you read any comics up. recently, Chris? I just read the new Transformers comic. That's when I was like, you know what? I should have picked up an issue of Transformers. There we go. Wilson is holding it up. Is it that one, Chris? That's the one. Ah, is that the end of the story arc yet? That's the know. beginning of yet. the second. That's, that's like the, beginning the beginning of the second, of the second arc. And Daniel this Warren, is, uh, Daniel Warren still... Johnson is no longer drawing it. Oh, he's no longer drawing still it. Still writing. Okay. Who's drawing it? Uh, Jorge something? Jorge Corona? Okay. There you go. He crushes it. He crushes it. <laughs> Corona. 
it's not everyone that that knows how, how to draw robots and yeah have, and have them have fluid movement and and fluid movement they have texture to them it's really amazing yeah. what he did <laughs> but i but you need footnotes from St smile and stan in my uh <laughs> <laughs> Picked up fourth issue of Bloody Dozen. No. It's it, it doesn't look like Jeff Senior, but nobody nobody since Jeff Senior knew how to draw the Transformers like that. Uh, fun issue, new art works says Undead Queen about the Transformers. Yeah, it, it cool. very much matches the previous issues. If you weren't paying attention, you can you could easily just pick it up and think it just continues. Yeah, that art style. Transformers, robots in disguise. So Corona's a good artist, says Sleepy Reader. Yes. Yeah, I don't think I know his work. At least I don't think I know his work because I have a hard time learning new artist names. <laughs> like, let's see, who who drew Birthright and is now doing uh, Dark Ride? That's Joshua Williamson is the writer. And Andre Bresson, is that his first name is the art? I can't remember. Bresson, I think, is B R E S. Because I keep wanting to say Luke Bresson, the director, <laughs> it's but Luke, it's not him. It's Luke, and it's not Bresson, it's Besson. Luke Besson. It's, how do you spell Besson. it? Uh, without an R. Oh, there's no R. Okay. There's an R in Bresson, Besson. I think. It's not, I can't. It's like you know. I've only I've only bought sixty issues of his, you know, comic. <laughs> I can't tell you, Andre. Yeah, it is Andre Andre Bresson. There we go. I got it right, Andre. Well, <laughs> I could I couldn't have sworn to it, but I thought that was it. Andre Speaking Bresson. That's, that's right. It's Andre Bresson and Luke Besson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of French, there's a the, the Portuguese edition of the latest Manu Lassini book is out, and I need to find money because that thing is going to cost like forty bucks. Wow! Uh, uh, but it's an it's another literary adaptation. Uh, okay. Of, of uh, Cormac Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Oh wow! And there's going to be a, a an English language edition uh, later All in right. the year. The, the guy won multiple Manuel Atsne. He won multiple awards for his adaptation of the, the Brodeck Report, which was okay. a, a, a German novel. Uh -huh. What's his name? Uh, uh, Manu Larsene. Okay. You'll have, you'll have to write that down for me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so I can... Corona drew mid Middle West. Okay, that was the... Who wrote that Middle West? Was that a Scotty Young project? I can't remember. I remember, I think I read an issue of it. And it was a, or an, issue, an issue or two of it, and it was pretty good, but I didn't stick with it. Last Dark Ride is a month behind. Uh, is, it that, is that the last issue of Dark Ride? I, because I think it, it seemed like, it, oh, there we go. Manu Larsenet. Larsenet, the, the T is silent because it's, it's the last Larsenet. letter in the word. I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Mm -hmm. Just so I remember. There we go. Well, Sleepy Reader will probably want to buy it when he sees it. It's right up his alley. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it is the last. Because cause I, I th it was kind of hinted at in the last issue of Dark Ride was going to be the last one. Um, Like the story was ending, but I wasn't sure if the comic was ending. But it seems like it's coming to a climax. But it's been a fun series. We'll have to see what the those... Um, Andre Bresson and Joshua Williamson are now on my automatic pull list list. You know, whatever the project they do next, I'll put on my pull list. And so is Joseph Schmalky. Seven Years in Darkness, the Shamir Worm. And um, this is the guy I discovered a couple of years ago. He was doing some like space books. And he's been doing this series, Seven Years in Darkness, but this is just a one shot that goes, it's a horror book about this, you know, dark school for magic. And this one is just 
the story of this like magical item slash creature, the Shamir worm. And nice little one shots. And it's always on this. Um, his books are on like this. They're not glossy. They're a, they got a nice thick cover stock, and they're on. Then they're on this matte paper, which goes well with the uh, horror aspect of it. So, a good one shot. Little actually, there's a little. There's no gloss to the cover at all, but there's a little bit of gloss to this. You know, it's not much. It's still mostly matte, but there's a little bit of gloss to it now that I look at it. But. Good, good series. The, the, once again, Paul Schmal, uh, Joseph Schmalke. I just discovered him, you know, a couple of years ago. Now he's made my automatic pull list stuff too. Do, 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 let's see. Ain't no groove is by God. Scotty Young, uh, Jorge Corona. Jo Jorge, yeah, jo yeah, Jorge. I'm losing my mind. It looks. More oh, is that the new one that's coming out? Ain't no yes, I just saw an ad for that. That looked nice. That one that one caught my attention. Um, ain't no grave. It's a newcom out next. Oh, it's off to see if it's on uh I don't think I've seen it on uh final order cutoff yet, which is I think five weeks. So I will look into that one definitely. I think I'll buy the I'll put the first issue of that on my poll list. Or pick it up off the shelf if I haven't, if it's passed by final order cutoff. But yeah, that one caught my eye, the art in it. Ain't no grave. Because I liked Scotty Young's, um, oh crap, what was it? Sleepy Reader will know. I know he bought it. The one with the artist who lived in the haunted house. Nice art in it. Can't remember who did it. Can't remember the name of it. Someone out there will remember it. Uh, the things you left behind? No, that's something else. <laughs> I don't remember. A, a, a young woman artist who moves into a, a suburban neighborhood and to get some painting done, and it's a haunted house. You know, you know what I want now on this. You do this, and random pizzas fly around. We need a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one. Mm -hmm. Who do I request that from? Apple? I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. What's that noise, Chris? What are you doing? What tools are you taking out? It's crayons. Crayons. Oh, he's doing one of his crayon ones. I just got some. What did I just get? There we go. To try out some Arteza premium classic felt pens. Um, I water-based ink, quick drying, non-toxic, non-bleeding, smear free. I think it said it was archival ink too, but now I see it nowhere on the package. Ideal for drawing, coloring, writing, outlining, journaling, and other drawing techniques. There's one of them. It's got this whoops, pointed tip that's pretty hard. There's no give to it. So you can make a pretty fine point with it. But saw this on Amazon for like 10 bucks. said, I'll try out there. Oh, Corona drew that one, too. And it's the me you love in the dark. There you go. Thanks, Undead Quinn. Sleepy and I couldn't remember the name. Oh, Corona did that. I'm definitely going to get that to Ain't No Grave then, because I liked his work. <laughs> yeah, the long titles are a pain. Speaking of long titles, new issue of Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees. At least this one wrong. 2099. So and um <laughs> what was that it's pay, oh 2099 oh. i thought he's saying right the on price, the end yeah i need the tree oh someone last week said this was a reference to something and i never got what the reference was marvel 2099 is that a kid a children's rhyme or something beneath the trees where nobody one i'm not familiar with 
but um, this is the one. That's that, it's like it's an old nursery. It's a nursery rhyme. That's where or, some, or I know it ends with. That's where the teddy bears have their picnic. Okay, that's where the teddy bears have their picnic because the star is a so, teddy bear, and it, the art is like an old nursery rhyme. Okay, it's an old. I just I'm not familiar with that nursery rhyme. But this is about a cool color with a cover with this duck's head. Um, the story in this one is that um, the main character, who I thought was a dude, is a woman bear. And turns out she's a serial killer. <laughs> you amuse sleepy reader with your 2099s. Uh <laughs> She's a serial killer, but she's been living quietly in this small town. You know, and she doesn't do any serial killing in a small town. She kidnaps people from the city and brings them to the small town to kill them and bury them. Um, and then she starts getting into trouble uh, because some somebody kind of discovers her. And it turns out the person who discovers her wants to be a serial killer, too. And she rebuffs him, and then he gets mad and kills somebody and and pins it on her. So at the end of last issue, she has to flee town because now the cops are looking for her in conjunction with these killings that have been going on in town that this younger serial killer has been has pinned on her. So this whole issue is her kind of disappearing into the big city to try and hide. But she, we, we find out this issue, she sees ghosts of the people she's killed and cut up. That, that's what the, this guy right here is, is one of the ghosts of the people she's killed. So, um, like, like randomly in the street, she sees them. She's like, oh, there's a, there's that dude. Um, so, so, you know, the, the whole issue is, sort of this inner dialogue of hers trying to figure out what she's going to do. Of course, at the end of the end of the issue gets, you know, um, ends up with her coming to the conclusion that she's got to go back to town and kill this serial killer. <laughs> so that's what they're setting up for either next issue or the next story arc, because this is issue five. So she's know. a serial killer. She's a serial killer. That's going to go kill a serial killer. Where yeah, have I heard that she, before? It's ripping off Dexter and Nurse Marvel twenty ninety nine. Dexter twenty ninety nine. That might be the new relaunch. <laughs> Dexter twenty ninety nine. Uh, yeah, they actually did that. They relaunched Dexter. Only it was you know twenty twenty two. Not now they got to put him in the future. Sam confronting her past is a nice touch. Yeah, it was it was a good issue. I have to track down issue one, though, since last week I got issue issue four was I know what four is. I yeah. swear. <laughs> issue, issue four. <laughs> Chris missed it. Issue four was the first issue I picked up last month. Then last week I got two and three. They came out with new printings of it. So I need a new printing of. Uh, Issue one. <clears throat> Who wants to do a read, rip, and slab? Let's do it. It's flamingo time. All right. Uh, let's pick a decade. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s? 2099. Don't bother to find the first print. Yeah, I am not <laughs> bothering to find a first print because that book has gotten hot. Do 60s. The sixties. All right, yeah. let's see. Let's see we are going to go to March nineteen sixty four. What do we got here? Ooh, Batman and Superman. Let me share my screen. Here we go. March 1964, we got Batman and Superman, Go Go Checks Comics, Batman 188, Action Comics 344, World's Finest 163. 
and I didn't know these, uh, I didn't realize like, um, there was no Superman or detective comics on the shelf this month. So it's like, they didn't, they didn't, I guess they alternated them bi-monthly. I didn't realize that. Detective should be. It's uh, Bat Batman and Superman were eight times a year. Oh, okay. But I Detective mean... and Action were both monthlies. Okay, maybe I did see a detective there, or I missed it. it may, maybe there's uh, there are times when the uh, publishing that's like on the on the second of the month, and then the next issue is on the 29th or something. But it's uh -huh. supposed to be the 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 next month. Dead Quinn says issue one has four reprints. I'll try to track down a fourth printing <laughs> or a third or a third print. We'll see which one's cheapest. I would slab Batman because it's Batman. I would because it's Batman. I would slab Batman. I would read World's Finest because it has both Batman and Superman in it. Ah, so unfortunately, that means I would have to rip Action Comics. Ah, so I was tempted to rip Batman and Robin because you could split those guys and <laughs> you can split World's Finest. Now that's all I ever see when I look at the. You, you could go uh, diagonal on action action comics and rip right in Superman's waist. Ah, that's true too. I would have I would replace the Eraser guy with the Dolphin because he's erasing Batman and Robin. So I have the Dolphin doing that jump to erase <laughs> Batman and Robin. But I want the flamingos watching Superman dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> those, those are my picks. Ah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to slap Batman because that is the the best concept cover. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read Action Comics because I want to see what the that nightmare is about, and rip World's Finest because that's the most basic plot. Uh, so, the most yeah, basic they're... plot. Come on, they're gladiators fighting. Mm, that Superman yeah, even the, has the net in Trident. Yeah, but you have That's the, right. He has Spider Man's webbing on Batman. Yeah. <laughs> why, why would Superman need that? I don't care. Uh, he Batman want to is so tricky, Batman. don't you know? That's right. He doesn't want to kill Batman. He just wants to harpoon him. <laughs> uh, I'm going to replace the first Superman in the Nightmare with the Dolphin. <laughs> and. And I'm going to put the the flamingos uh, perched on the harpoon. Perched where? On the harpoon. Ah, on the harpoon. <laughs> Let's see. Tit Goblin, he's going to read Batman, slab action because those Superman are slabbed. <laughs> oh, so it counts as infinity cover. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Rip World's Finest, Dolphin the Dreaming Superman, and put Art Wasp on the pencil guy. <laughs> Art Wasp is what I painted on my new jacket. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see, what's Sleepy going to do? He's going to read action, slab World's Finest, rip Batman. Superman was much more fun to read at the time, in his opinion. Let's see, Undead Queen is going to read Batman. Uh rip action and slab world's finest okay i think i'm gonna hmm what am i gonna do i think i want to slab world's finest because i love that cover it's just i mean it's got logos on it it's got word balloons it's got i mean it's got three logos on it you you can't get more logos for your money than that cover right there and, you know two word Superman balloons and batman Two word balloons, three logos, uh, a caption, and su still room for Superman and Batman to fight. I like the historical aspect of it. So I'm slabbing World's Finest. I'm, I'm going with Sleepy and reading Action Comics, so I have to rip Batman. And I'm going to rip Batman's... I'm going to go right down the center of that Batman, so I rip Batman's arm off. Chris will tell us 2099 in 2099 what he would do. <laughs> and let's I'm see gonna what I read, want to I'm going to read Spider-Man 2099 because I, I you know, I always love Peter David's acerbic wit. 
I'm I'm going to rip X Men 2099 because I don't see a, uh, Wolverine on the cover. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to and I'm going to slab Ravage 2099 because that is a new Stanley creation. So you know that that's going to escalate in value in the future. There you go. <laughs> I think I'm going to dolphin Batman so that Superman has got him in a net and is about to stab him. Mm. And the um, animal cruelty from, Superman. Animal cruelty Superman. Superman is a jerk. Uh, you you amuse sleepy reader again, <laughs> Chris. And I'm putting right. the flamingos on that yellow wall back behind. Uh, they'll he'll, they'll be in with the crowd, giving a thumbs down. Even though they have no thumbs. <laughs> Let's see. Thumbs down gives us the lightning and rain. There we go. Little small lightning and rain. Let's see. Who do you think did these covers? Is that a Kurt Swan cover on action? I believe World's Finest is Kurt Swan as well. Who was doing Batman? Is, Carmen, is that a Carmen Infantino cover? Or was that before Carmen? No. Yeah, because Carmen was... Oh, I don't remember if he was... It's not the new look Batman yet, right? What year was the new look Batman? 64. It is the new look Batman. Okay. The, logo, so, the, the, yellow, the yellow circle. Ah, so that is probably Infantino then. That would be my guess. The best dressed corpses in Gotham City. Calling all Batman fans. So let's go to the Grim Comics database. Batman 188. Oh, I didn't even notice it. Reading action comics, you might get some Batman too, because it's calling all Batman fans. Yeah. Oh, look and, at that. Unless it was just trying to tie in, uh, I don't know, with the new look Batman. Superman's Nightmare Dreams. Because I was thinking, you know, it could be calling all Batman fans, but. Batman 66 hasn't happened yet. What does GCTD tell us? It, it is in Infantino on, on Batman. Okay. And it's Kurt Swan. Is it Kurt Swan? Here's no. It is. It is Kurt Swan on, on the other two. Okay. Yeah, you can always tell with that uh, Superman's upper body. It's that <laughs> barrel chest is always Kurt Swan. Inked by George Klein. Oh, okay. Some mainstream 1966 comics for us tonight. Speaking from comics of the past, facsimile edition of Marvel Superhero ah. Secret Wars, issue number four. Whoa. One of my favorite covers where the Hulk yeah. is holding the mountain up. And he's not happy. And he's not happy. Are you a Secret Wars fan, Chris? Are you the right age for that? I am the right age for it. Yes. <laughs> But are you a fan? And I can't claim that I'm a super fan of it, but I, I, I did like it at the time. You bought it and liked it. I bought it and I liked it. I thought it was cool. But um, you're not buying it again. I, I don't need to buy it again. You're no super fan. It's, it. weird. it's weird that they're <laughs> selling it again, but I guess, yeah, I guess I'm not a super fan. You're you're no Wilson Ramos. Do you know Wilson Ramos? I do. Have you worked with Wilson Ramos? I have. <laughs> and, am, and am I, sir, a uh, Wilson Ramos? You, sir, are no Wilson Ramos. Oh, shh. Okay. <laughs> that's that's fair. When they do facsimiles of St of Secret Wars in the year 2099, it will be called Secret Wars 2099. 
<laughs> That's true. In 2099, every Marvel comic will be a Marvel 2099 book. Whoa. Whoa. My Jeff surfs. Do you, you think they'll capitalize on that with a bunch of gimmick covers? Yes. And, uh, and there will be a new number one. Spider-Man 2099, 2099. <laughs> number one. Wow. Number, number one. one. By Peter David 2099. <laughs> wow. Uh, Eric P is Well, by then in. AI is going to be running the show, so so that so it will be. It'll be a they'll they'll feed everything that Peter David ever wrote into AI. And 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 by then everybody will think that that's a that's they'll have gotten over this thing where people don't like AI right now. And because AI will have convinced us, and, and yeah, and the special <laughs> edition cover, special edition issue will be printed on newsprint. They got the last <laughs> tree available, and they make <laughs> newsprint from it. Because by then, all the comic books yeah. will be made in holograms. <laughs> yeah, it will be a one in two fifty variant. <laughs> Slavey wants to know yes. is there a Wilson Ramos facsimile for his friends to collect? <laughs> Not yet, but they're working on it. Pit Goblin <laughs> says, in 2099, I'll be reading Radiant Comics 2099. There you go. <laughs> Written and drawn by Jared 2099. Yeah. Well, I'll, we'll be, I'll be a AI. robot of some sort. I... Yeah, we'll, we'll put you into, into an AI, and you will still do Radiant Comics. Can I be a robot with a hammer? <laughs> You can. You're an AI. You can be anything you want. Ah. And Eric P is popping in for a minute to recommend the issue of Fantastic Four 19 from this week, which was a one and done issue that was mostly a fun noir mystery. Okay. Yeah, I remember um I guess it was last year I bought Fantastic Four Six and Seven for the Scott Koblish covers, and they were pretty well done. I enjoyed both of those issues. So I guess uh I wonder if the must be the same creative team because they haven't relaunched it. <laughs> right. They now just relaunch everything with a new creative team. Let's see. The last, the fifth and last comic I got this week was Napalm Lullaby. By Rick Remender and Ben Gall, or Ben Gal. I don't know how he says his name. Just the one named dude. And this is the one that uh, I picked up the first issue of last week and thought it was okay. And okay enough for me to pick up the second issue. But it hasn't gone on my pull list yet. But I think it might, or I'll just get the third issue and read that one, see how that is. But this is the one that um, the first six pages of the first issue were like a Superman story, where this baby from outer space in a spaceship was found by this couple who it turns out were members of a cult. Then it flash forward 40 or 50 years, and the cult runs the whole world. And then the story took over where there's this brother and sister who have some sort of, you know, it takes place in the future in this world run by the cult where this brother and sister have decided they want to do something about this guy running the world. We still have no idea what. This whole issue is just kind of them reaching this holy city or something. So it's like, it's some kind of we're going to topple the head guy story. But it's really kind of casual. There doesn't They don't seem to have any plan. They're just going here and there, doing this and that, collecting this and that, talking to people to try to get their plan together. And then I enjoyed it. But I really... Well, they couldn't tell you what it. I couldn't concisely tell you what it was about. I I guess it's some sort of kind of caper book. But the caper is topple Superman, who's head of a cult, and we've never even seen the Superman character except except as a baby. 
knowing Rick Remender, he could write that character out and have another character, the head of the cult, at any moment now. <laughs> you, know, you know Rick Remender? No. But I know his writing, I should say. Sorry for not being literal enough for Chris. I know he, he insists <laughs> on literalism. <laughs> Ed Coblin says, in 2099, you'll have your own Jared religion, like the superheroes do in the 2099 stories. I'll be Grendel, you know? Grendel 2099. People will put on my jacket when, and become Jared, yeah. my painted jacket. They'll, they'll have their own war cry. <laughs> Viva Jared. <laughs> I think this was the last week of my winter jacket. It's time to move on. I'll show you my new painted spring one. Hold on. Here we go. Those are the two weird orb eyes on the front. The last thing I painted on was this blue striping. Here are the art wasps on the pockets. There's one on that pocket and one on that pocket. Then I, uh, I put pinup girls on the sleeves. One pinup girl there. One pinup girl there. One pinup girl? Two pinup girls. <laughs> then, of course, the back. Many pinup girls. There's all sorts of fun stuff on it. Very nice. So this will make its debut next week. And in oh. 2099, someone else with their battle cry will be wearing it. I stole oh. that from Grendel. No 2099, though. Will, will you be able to replicate uh, Grendel's fork? Or, or will you settle for its fork? I actually, back in college, went as Grendel for uh, Halloween. Glad you love the back of the jacket, Sleepy. When does Grendel for Halloween? And what I did was I had like um it was a small a small stiff cardboard tube about the size of his fork that on the top I attached two butter knives to <laughs> and painted it black. Uh, I made Grendel's fork out of butter knives and cardboard. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> you didn't think to take a picture of that. I, I did not. I wasn't that bright when I was in college. <laughs> I didn't have a, I never I didn't learn to take as many pictures as I learned to in the future. <laughs> Tit Goblin says, Homer, you've ruined a perfectly good jacket. Correction, Marge. Two perfectly good jackets. <laughs> I kid, those art jackets are awesome. <laughs> art jackets. Oh, my final order cutoff emails have come in, so I know what I'll be doing after the show. Mm -hmm. Looking at them and see what's coming out in five weeks or whenever it is. Or the ring more. Is, is Venom? Is Venom vs. Reborn showing up yet in these orders? I have not seen it. Or I've, I may have, I've not noticed it, I should say. But I don't look that closely at the Marvels. Wilson, do you every week look at the... Uh, do they send you something every week to look at from Midtown? I get, I get constant emails that I kind of ignore. So oh, okay. I don't get like a final cutoff or anything like that. But I do get emails more so for the store in general. With sales right. that, that's going on and things like that. Yeah, I, as, I, far I, as, as far as information, I usually just go through the catalogs. Ah, okay. Yeah, I <laughs> said my, my, you know, my my LCS owner wrote the code himself on this email. So I'm like, you should sell that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, every yeah. comic shop should send out an email every week where you just hit a button and you. Get the comic on your pull list. 
That makes it really convenient. Don't even have to go to the website or anything. Just click on the button. Actually, you have to click on two buttons, I think. You click on the button, and it shows you a preview of the comic. Then you click on that button to add it or not. Oh, okay. Because the email is just like a, uh, a list of the name. And if you want to see who does it and what the cover is and everything, you click on the button, the second button. <laughs> I never know anything about Final Order Cutoff. Yeah, Sleepy. Probably, probably most comic fans don't. Because, you know, I don't think most comic shops send out Final Order Cutoff forms. Like, you know, my my comic shop, every week I get an email. of. Matter of fact, they just broke it up into um, trades, too. Trades used to not be on the final order cutoff. Now they have their own email. We have the final order cutoff of trades. So it looks like the Venomverse Reborn is coming out in June. You hear that, Chris? June. And that's Which June number? of this year, not June of 2099. It says issue one of four. All right. For June. Number number two is going to have a, a mini Marvel strip in it. Ah. Oh, okay. So get number two if you want some Chris Jerusso artwork. Number two, folks, give it, give it number two that bump. If yeah, you want buys number more one. 2099 jokes, <laughs> Undead Queen well, says, unfortunately, I unfortunately, I wrote and drew it before today. <laughs> so there are no <laughs> 2099 jokes. So there will be no 2099. There will be no 2099 jokes in it. Godzilla, yeah, King of Monsters, facsimile of. Godzilla vs. Uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters issue number one. Are they, are, are they putting together an omnibus of that? I believe they are. I believe they're putting together the Marvel ones. <coughs> Sleepy Reader now says my my com my shop owner generally seems to know less about upcoming comics than I do. <laughs> I think that happens sometimes. Hey, Symbiote twenty ninety nine. Ooh. Symbiote Spider Man 2099. Number four of five. The series must have already started. They're they're ripping off the bloody dozen. <laughs> oh, look at this. Uncle Scrooge Infinity Dime. With an Alex Ross cover. Wow. <laughs> so it looks like a crossover event's going on. And is that a Marvel? Dine number one. Yeah, is Marvel putting these out? Wow, Very, Marvel. Very Marvel covers. putting out a Disney book. I don't think I've seen that yet. Has Marvel put out any Disney character books? They've been putting out, well, I know they've been putting out those alternate covers with the Disney characters. Yeah, yeah. On it, but I have not seen an actual book book that I recall. Is that an actual book? For the first time ever, Marvel and Disney team up to bring you the story of the century. So yeah, this is an it's a book that they're putting together. Oh, it's an actual Uncle Scrooge story. Uncle Scrooge story. 64 page one oh, shot. 64 page one shot? What's the price on it? $12? $7.99. Okay, not bad. <laughs> Here's the list of the variant covers. Wow. Hold on, let me get that bigger so Paolo can see it. <laughs> Alex Ro Frank Miller, Peach Momoko, Scotty Young, Gabriel Delato, Joe Casada, Walt Simonson, J. Scott Campbell, Elizabeth Tork, John Romita Jr., Ron Lim, Lorenzo Pastrovicio. Pastrovicio. Uh, pa Pastrovicio. Vicchio. Vicchio. Pastrovicio. CCH is pronounced like a K because ah. the H is there. Pastrovicio. Elizabeth Torque might be the only name I don't recognize there. Actually, I don't recognize Lorenzo Mastrovicio either, but, <laughs> yeah, but no, I, most of those other names I recognize. Uh, the, the, the Italian guys doing the art are probably from the, the Italian studio who does the, the Disney stories for Ah, uh, okay. Europe, right. Europe. That would make sense. 
That would make sense. And they're doing a big push on the ultimate stuff. So, that's right. They just I mean, relaunched all that's that, what right? The cover is. Yeah. The ultimates will redefine comics again. I doubt it, but you know, yeah. we can hope. Who are the two names at the top of that ultimates? Dennis Camp and Juan Frigari. And Dennis with a Z. Yeah, so a couple of people that nobody's ever heard of are going to revolutionize the whole cover by Dake Dake Ruan. And then in the huh. inside of the book, it starts starts here, and we have uh, <laughs> new new ongoing series. So it's Ultimates number one, and there are all the alternate covers. <laughs> Undead Queen says that Frank Miller has me worried. His last covers were no, not great. Uh, we'll give Frank a break. He's old and not in great health. Well, he has a guy here in Portugal who, who can uh, do, do ghost work for him. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm just happy Frank Miller's still alive, you know? Yeah. What what happened to what happened to Frank Miller turned into a crazy conservative era with his uh so like I have no I, I see I don't know if that was a put on or not. When back when Holy Terror came out and there was this whole Frank Miller's turned into a crazy conservative and he put out that statement that I wasn't sure if it was a put on or not. And then it all just sort of faded away, and now he's just kind of like an elder statesman of comic, not being like, putting out crazy conservative state. I don't, I, I don't know if that whole thing was a put on or not. I don't think it was. Hey, Jared. Yeah. Do you know if it was a put on? No, I don't. Do you know? No, I don't. I don't know either. I thought you, you sure? might know. I do not know. I, Are you sure you don't? Know? I figured. Is that, I figured if anyone had the answers, answers, it would be you. Tonight. I'm coming to you for answers because you know all the 2099 stuff. I figured you'd know this. You too. always have all the answers, Green Arrow. What's your answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> Frank Miller just snapped her a bit. Maybe that was it. I <laughs> as undead queen. <laughs> that could be it. I. Uh, I just don't know. Maybe Chris knows. Let's maybe check out maybe Chris. he was led astray uh, in the wake of 9-11 uh, and thinking that our enemies were a specific group of people that maybe didn't turn out to be the case or not. Uh-huh. Sleepy Reader says, I think Miller backed away from the things he said at that time. Could be. Eh? I, like I, said, I certainly haven't heard him repeat them in... And what year did Holy Terror came out? That was a long time ago now, right? Yeah, that was quite some time was ago. Was that the aughts? Yeah, the I think teens? so. I think it was the aughts. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Does Chris know? Chris, do you know? I believe it was in the wake. It was in the wake of 9-11. So it must have been the aughts. Could 2002 on Dead Queen said, Wow, it was that long ago. So that was really in the week. Right, wow, time 22 years ago? And people are still complaining? <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's complaining. They're complaining about his current art, but they're not complaining about Holy Terror. Ghost Rider 2099. Oh, you can get the Omnibus, right? Is that Omnibus. omnibus? That means they'll have my artwork in it. My first published coloring oh. uh, work was in the last issue of Ghost Rider 2099. Jo Joe Andriani came by came by my office and was like, you want to color a pinup? This was like a Friday. And I was uh -huh. like, sure. Took it home, colored it up, came back on Monday. He went in and did a couple of little changes to it, and then that was it. That was my first pub published Marvel comic book book ah. that was done in the last issue of a book that got canceled. <laughs> Joe Andriani, <laughs> may he rest in peace. 
He was the first one to give me a coloring, the coloring go- job. He went on to he went on to become a cop. Did he? And I then, didn't know that. Wait, and then died of cancer. I didn't know that guy 10, died. Fifteen years ago. Yeah, that was Joe Andriani. I'm thinking of right. Yeah. Yeah, he did pass. Yeah. We were just talking about him in our Marvel group recently. Sleepy, huh. unfortunately, no. Uh, colorist, <laughs> he got colorist, royalty. colorist do not get uh, royalties. Or during the time I did them. Because well, I would love to. I would love sure to. I'm sure they'll send you a complimentary copy. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the closest that I'm getting to a complimentary copy is this image right here in this book. Uh, no, I, I would have loved if they gave me a Deadpool omnibus because my work appeared in that because I colored a couple of issues of Deadpool and Wolverine and I don't get copies of any of that <laughs> at all. Thor, none of that. Though the weirdest thing is like seeing my work in what they what they were calling it was Deadpool classics, uh-huh. and it's like, oh, that makes me feel older than I should. <laughs> Has any work. of your work been recolored? I do not know, considering I don't get copies of those books. Right, right. So I have no idea. By the time I was coloring comics, most of them, I'm, I'm on that cusp where right. it went from color guys to computer. And so they should have the computer stuff but archived. Some, sometimes but they even recolored some of the computer stuff to make it right. look more modern. Right. I have only, not seen. Mm-hmm. Only because I know that only because oh oh what's his name the colorist I follow on Facebook Villabro Villarubia. What was that? Jose Villarubia. Okay, I, I think that's it. Um, but he's always putting up examples of recoloring. Right. I think he has a thing called uh, colorist point of view or colorist like that. perspective or colorist point of view or something like yes. that. Yes. And and there's some stuff recolored that I'm like, there's yeah. four different color versions of that. <laughs> I can see that because I've recolored a lot of stuff, like a lot of the star comics. When they went to trade paperback, I recolored a lot of those. Colorists are just humble peons. Well, one of my favorite quotes that I've said to Dave Sharp many, many times over the years is, there goes the letterer thinking he's a human being again. (laughs) (laughs) They get, they hardly ever get any respect, the letterers. (laughs) At least the colorists these days get mentioned. (laughs) Another read, rip, and slab? Sure. What year do you want? What decade? Pick a decade. We just did 2099. <laughs> Let's go back to the 50s. Let's go back to the 50s. Let's go to 1952. We'll go pre-code. Ooh. Well, we don't the code doesn't doesn't quite apply to this. This is 1952, September, little girls. We got Nancy and Sluggo, Marge's Little Lulu, and Little Eva. I I, I don't remember Little Eva. I never heard of Little Eva. What's that logo there? The publisher's logo. Oh, Little Eva? I don't know. Let me let me zoom in over here and look at it. See if I can. It's Oh man, I can, that's that's just a smudge. <laughs> I, yeah. That is the the um St. John Publishing. St. John. Mm-hmm. The uh the images on Mike's newsstand are not high resolution. Right. Oh, <laughs> I res them up pub- a bit, but can't there's recover. The guys that. Who published it rhymes with lust. Yeah? In 19, yeah, in 1950. I remember their name, St. John's. I've, I've yeah. heard them before. They were. Awesome. Oh, Lisa's here. I mean, Liz. I said oh, Lisa. Liz Lapoff. Liz, there Liz, she is. 
Liz is here. Is she starting Hi, from the beginning? She definitely worked on Barbie. Oh, uh, Trina. Okay. Yes. So is she? Is she be watching from the beginning? Because she's gonna have to. <laughs> nah, well, nah, to catch nah, up. Nah, nah, nah. There we go. Liz worked with us at Marvel. Okay, so she just discovered go. the YouTube channel. <laughs> I would slab little Lulu. I would read little Eva because I know nothing of it. And unfortunately, that means Nancy and Sluggo gets ripped down to center. <laughs> See you, Nancy and Sluggo. I would. I would. Pl I would. I think put the flamingos behind the leaves, staring at little Lulu. <laughs> and I would replace the kite with the dolphin. <laughs> I'm going to slab Nancy and Sluggo and read little Eva so I will rip little Lulu. Uh, not, not a very engaging cover there. And the doll I will replace the cashier in little Eva with the dolphin. <laughs> and the flamingos are standing on the top of the ostrich sign. Uh huh. I'm put. I know. I'm putting the flamingos on the scale on the little Eva cover. Oh, that's a good spot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stand them there. I think. I think they'll fit in. Let's see what Tit Goblin is doing. He is slabbing little Eva, ripping Lulu, reading Nancy, Dolvin the kite, art wasp for that leaf. <laughs> Let's see. Sleepy Reader is reading Nancy 2099, slabbing little Eva, and ripping up Lula 2099. <laughs> I think I'm I'm gonna slab Marge's little Lulu just because I can really see the influence on uh Seth and Palookaville in that drawing. I could tell that uh, Seth w was a big Little Lulu fan. Uh, what's the name of the artist who did Little Lulu? There, there was someone who... There's like Never. one person who's who's kind of associated... One artist, I think, associated with Little Lulu, if I'm not mistaken. So that means I'm going to rip Little Little Eva... And slab Nancy and Sluggo. When I rip little Eva, I'm going to try to get right on that post that's uh, behind the cashier. <laughs> Always looking for that spot to rip. So it won't be right in half, but it'll be near enough. Oh, what was the name of the little Lulu artist? I never read an issue of little Lulu. Nancy I remember logo I've read before. Yeah, I've read, Eva, read the I Nancy comic. It. I have some Nancy comic strip original art from Guy Gilchrist. Oh, really? Yeah. From I think the aughts I bought it in. He was the new Nancy and Sluggo artist, you know, 20 years ago. Now here's the question. They're trying to show us that that uh, little Eva is being mischievous by carving all the pumpkins into jack-o'-lanterns. Do you think that shopkeeper can get more money for them as jack-o'-lanterns than regular pumpkins? He should. They're pre-carved as a work of art. Yeah. Right. But if it's not Halloween, you want... <laughs> Well, I've, I've never seen a pumpkin for sale when it's not Halloween. <laughs> oh, but you can buy pumpkins. Uh, you, you just don't buy uh, full-size pumpkins. You, huh? you you buy them in slices or, or have. I have maybe. I have never in my life seen a pumpkin for sale outside of Halloween you, season. And then you do a soup with them. Ah. Does, uh, what about Thanksgiving season? When. But if, if we don't know if it's Thanksgiving season. Usually they're still hanging around at Thanksgiving, but I don't notice them for sale. Were Never you had pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving? Yeah, made with canned pumpkin. 
-hmm. I have made pumpkin pie. You can't trick me. No one makes pumpkin pie with fresh pumpkin, mister. Were you thinking okay. John Stanley? I, did, at the I, I didn't know that. John Stanley, that's who I'm thinking of. Yes. Okay. John Stanley. I think he's the one most associated with Little Lulu. I don't know if he did all of them. But uh, that's the name I was trying to... And who was an influence on Seth and Palookaville. And a lot, and other people, too. You know, Little Lulu was a popular strip. But I can really see Seth in that uh, cover right there. He's credited for writing... Uh also writing Little Lulu from 1945 to 1959. Uh-huh. And did, he drew it too, right? It lists him as artist and comic book okay. writer. Best okay. for writing Little Lulu. So it All doesn't right. really specify he drew it or not. I think he did. So I think I have an art book of his somewhere. Somewhere I have a one shot little Lulu John Staley art book. Matter of fact, did DC put it out with their Millennium books? I cannot remember. I'm gonna have to look, I'm gonna have to dig through my stuff and try and find it. So, what are you gonna do, Chris? Oh, what are you gonna books? read, Rip and Slab? Ooh, I think I'm gonna uh, copy Wilson. I want to read Little Eva because I never heard of it. Um, I'll slab Nancy because uh, it's probably going to escalate in value and, and it'll help me put my kids through college. <laughs> and I'll tear up Little Lulu because I have read Little Lulu. Ah. And, and uh, nothing against it. It's just I know that I can, I can find another copy of it. <laughs> I think Little Lulu comics might be more popular than Nancy and Sluggo comics. I'm not sure. But I know Little Lulu in the past has had a following. I don't know if it's enough of a following to make the prices go up on Little Lulu. Mm. And the Simpsons Lulu. had, um, oh, what was the writer? I think Neil Gaiman reading Little Lulu in an episode ah. of the Simpsons. <laughs> well, Little, Lulu, Little Lulu is more of a, kind of a strip character. so She's a comic a strip there. character? Yeah. I thought Nancy was more of a comic strip character. They both were. They I both think they were. both. I only know Little Lulu from the comic books. The Brazilians were create, creating new Little Lulu stories in the 1980s, way after uh, Dell had stopped. <laughs> uh, Undead Quinn says, I'm a hot stuff person. Me too. My last order a few months ago that I got from mycomicshop.com I ordered a hot stuff comic just because I wanted one in my before I co collected comics. Like my comic book origin story is, which I've told before on here. When I was nine, I got Hulk 200, and my neighbor had Hulk 201, 202, and 203. And that's when I first discovered they all went in a row and told a big story. So I traded all the comics I had, just about, probably not all of them, but a whole bunch of them, enough that to overwhelm my neighbor. So he traded me Hulk 201, 202, and 203 for like 30 comics, however many it was. And that was what I consider from the beginning of my collecting. I know I read comics before then. And all I remember about reading comics before then was I liked hot stuff. That's the my entire memory of reading comics from like nine below. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't until I discovered they all went in a row and told one big story that I um, started collecting. And then I think with, it was with issue 204, I think Herb Trimpey drew it. And the other one, Sal Buscema drew. And I was like, what's going on here? Why does the Hulk look different? And of course, my, you know, nine, I may have been 10 by then. I can't remember how many months went by. Your old brain, you know, doing investigating, discovered the credit boxes and was like, wow, people do these things. That's why they look different. 
Well, they're putting Hot out model. the they're putting out an epic collection of the Incredible Hulk. Ah, cool. They've got a bunch of epic collections of the Incredible Hulk. What issues are those ones? Uh, this they don't one do them in, like they don't do them in time order. It's a good thing that they don't. Okay, so this looks like it's going to be collecting issues Hulk 227 through 244. That was still my era. Right. And then the issues. annual 7 through 9. Yep. Captain America number 230. The Marvel Calendar 1979. Ooh, cool. and, <laughs> and material from the Marvel Treasury Edition 20 and 24. And it's a whole forty nine ninety nine. Oh, those those are expensive now. They were supposed to be the cheap versions. Now they're expensive. And they're doing they're doing a She Hulk one as well. Uh -huh. I I have the very first volume of the Hulk Epic Collection. I got it a few just a few years ago. Um, it's got one through six and a bunch of the tales of suspense stuff. And I got that one because I realized. I don't have Hulk one through six anywhere except in the little pocketbook, which is what I read as a kid. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I want some full size issues of that. And I actually have a lot of the Tales of Suspense stuff I've had since I was a kid in the Fireside Hulk book. That was always one of my favorites. Ooh, and that Ghost Rider 2099 Omnibus hardcover is $100. Whoa. It's 632 pages. You can, you can get it for cheaper online, though. 62, yeah, you can buy them individually. <laughs> yeah, 62 Lefty Blues says, Richie Rich was a classic. I enjoyed that as a kid, too. I remember reading some of those. Tit Goblin says, I hate all the funny page pages era of comics. Way before my time, so I have no nostalgia for them. Tried over the years, but they're too juvenile. No one had cybernetic eyes or sentient hell caves. No, but Good. but you had Vikings with, with domestic issues. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun to look at, but you know they're not my favorite comics. And yes, we get it. The cat hates Mondays. <laughs> and Tit Goblin says, "I would read twenty ninety nine Little Lulu though." <laughs> well, who wouldn't? Go, going back to to the beginning of of web of talking about web comics. Uh, uh huh. One one web comic that I missed uh, it's not being updated anymore. Garfield minus Garfield. Oh yeah, that was a good one. I even bought the print book they put out. <laughs> you ever see that? I, I did see a it. few of them. Yeah. Yes. The print, but yeah, they actually put out one the Garfield size of the Garfield strips that the Garfields are always printed in. The guy was a genius. He finally understood oh, yeah. why Garfield sucked. It was yeah. a cat. Take yeah. out the cat, and it's much funnier. Remove the cat, and it's all about the existential angst of what John Arbuckle. John, John mm -hmm. Arbuckle. Yeah, I don't know how I pulled that name out of my brain, but I did. Probably from the uh, book jacket of <laughs> of uh, Garfield minus Garfield. John used to have in the beginning of the strips. John used to have a roommate that disappeared. And they never talked about him again. And then there was a rumor he might have killed them. And yeah. that's why he has Garfield in his mind yeah. uh, to deal with it. But there's no Garfield that exists. Chuck Cunningham, right? Richie's older brother. Was that his yeah. name? Yeah. <laughs> disappeared after season one. YouTube lasagna cat, if you like Garfield minus Garfield. Oh, okay. Lyman. Was the guy's name, I think. Oh, Lyman was his uh, roommate. Roomie? Yeah. The last book I picked up, because you know I love a crossover. This is Godzilla and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers you... 2. It was IDW. <laughs> and Power Rangers are facing off with Godzilla once again. I... I saw that on the stands this week and said, I know Wilson's getting this one. <laughs> on the cover, I believe that is Space Godzilla. Not Godzilla uh -huh. himself yet. 
So I have not seen anything about it yet. Uh, but let's see, we can find a picture here with them on it so I can show you what it looks like. Ooh. It looks like some generic Power Ranger monsters. Some tentacles. And let's see, we can find one with Godzilla. Huh. Guess he doesn't make a full appearance in this first issue. Oh, well, oh. here we go. There he is. Cool. And who's the creative team? All right. So it's story by Colin Bunn. Okay. Art art by Ballard Revis and colored by Andrew Dollhouse. Lettered by Johanna Natalie. Natalie? Natalie. Colin Bunn? Is, no, it's the Sewell who did this one, not Bunn. Rears? R I U R S. Yeah, I don't know if that's a U or it's supposed to be a V. It's hard to tell. But I think it is a U. It is hard to tell with some of these fonts they pick. Yep. Very so, cool. Looking forward to reading that. Godzilla's been jumping around. He's been over at DC. He's over uh, here in IDW. Is Here's some Marvel? of the old, old alternate covers. He's back over at Marvel, the classic one. So he's he's making this uh, his tour. Yeah. They'll license Godzilla to anybody. <laughs> yep. You can pay the license fee, you're in. And this is one of the regular books. Here be dragons. But I think this is an ad for the trade paperback. And well, it's the 70th anniversary, so So get lots of Godzilla one. out there. And then there's a Ninja Turtles black, white, and green coming out. Aha. Uh -huh. Classic. Has there been... I'm just trying to think. Any giant monsters on the level of Godzilla or King Kong in the last... I mean, they're old. They're old. There hasn't I mean, really been any many. Any popular ones? They've tried, but they haven't lasted yeah uh, you know the cloverfield monster was an attempt but it didn't right. work um you had great mm -hmm. designs you had great designs for the uh pacific rim monsters okay. visually they look good man. Stay there go. hey there's only one good drawing of the state plush state plush marshmallow man we all know that that's true we Very all know true. that um There's not really no. uh, newer ones that have had the staying power. Uh, Gorgo from the 60s, right? That's Steve right. Ditko. All, no, all the big monsters are just from that time period way back when. There hasn't yeah. been anything new. Because even the Power Rangers, they have good looking <laughs> you know, robots, but the monsters didn't last too long. Ultraman is maybe the closest. Because because every few years Ultraman gets revamped and they These update their somewhere. monsters, yeah. So they they you know they revamp some of their monsters, but nothing that has the same staying power what, as those. What was the last Godzilla monster created to join sort of his rogues gallery? Because like Mothra and uh, Mecha Godzilla and Mega and all those guys you fought, they're all old too. Yeah, well, there was the, the the Godzillas of the '90s and the early 2000s had brought in some newer ones or updated ones, like uh, uh, they they made updates to most of those monsters, and then they made some stuff like Megas Megalosaurus, which is almost an updated Mothra, but it's a different insect. It's more of a dragonfly, so that was a newer one. 
and they were um, from Godzilla 2000 itself. Orga was a kind of spaceship type of monster, uh-huh. but that was about it. Pit Goblin says the staying power is stay puffed. I agree with Chris. American made kaiju. You, you know, he might be. I mean, I can't think of any giant monster that is more popular than Stay Puffed. And who'd been created. In the, I mean, and he's he's from what, 1984? He's 84. He's 84. So he's 40 yeah. years old. But he might be the youngest of the giant monsters who are popular. Right. And, you know, he certainly hasn't had movies made about him, but still, he's. After that, you have the Cloverfield creature. I don't. Yeah, I don't even know what the Cloverfield creature looks like. That's the that's the point. Nobody's supposed to, to know. You you you, you never, only you see know, him. You only you only see him at the end. Yeah. And it's a very quick shot. And story wise, that's the baby. They never yeah. showed the mom, the mother. That's a uh. bigger monster. Uh, you could also say the 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 the. The alien queen from, oh, what was it called? Independence Day Two, is kind yeah, of a kaiju because it all. was because it was a lot it was a lot bigger mm-hmm. than the regular aliens from it, so that was practically kaiju size. But again, no real staying power toys or anything really made out of it. So, um, and Cloverfield had one toy ever made of it. Um, and Pacific Rim, all almost all their kaiju's had toys, but again, it didn't go any further. You know, there was yeah, no that's... there was no cartoon show. At least the American Godzilla had a cartoon show, and it was actually a pretty good cartoon show compared to the movie Godzilla, and that was ninety four. And, um, and I haven't seen Pacific Rim, but wasn't that more of a doomsday movie? Than a where the doomsday happened to be giant monsters than a giant monster movie. Like most giant monster movies aren't about doomsday. They're about, you know, Godzilla, someone attacking a city, maybe. There's right. immediate danger. But like when you make you when you make it about doomsday, well, then that's not really a giant monster movie anymore. The giant monsters are just sort of the mechanism of doomsday. Right. Sort of like how The Walking Dead isn't really a zombie comic. Yeah, the only Uh, other... Jared, there's zombies in every issue. Literally. (laughs) You're knocking me off my chair. Stop it. (laughs) Only other ones are the Star Wars monsters. So, you know, Sarlacc, uh, Rancor. Rancor. Rancor's made a bunch of different appearances. Okay. The Zillow Beast Sandworms, in the cartoons. Aren't, aren't they the have Rancors? their own Sand Wars? Sand no, the Rancors Sand... are not. Which is, are... The that, which is the one that almost ate um, Boba Fett? Sarlacc. That doesn't move, but they do oh, have okay. Sand Worms, but the Sarlaccs don't move. They just stay okay. in that place. Okay. Tick Goblin wants to know, has anyone been watching X-Men 97? Yes. I really like this popcorn. I, I have not watched it. I get. I have watched it. I enjoyed it a lot. I know everybody I was crying at the latest episode, so yeah. I, I, I don't know what they're crying about, but I know there was a lot of emotion in it for a lot of yes, people. Yes, there, there was. A, it was basically the X-Men's version of a 9-11 with Genosha and destroying ah. Genosha, and a few known characters had passed in the story. Okay. And heroic, heroic deaths, because they're superheroes. So yeah. I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. But reading comics and knowing how comics works... Death holds no stakes for you. That's the problem. Right, right. But again, to watch it, it was very well done. And if you were a fan of it, of the X-Men as a kid, you're enjoying it because it, it it very much stays with the spirit of that '90s cartoon. Mm-hmm. 
Pit Goblin asks, would Galactus be considered an American version of Kaiju in comics? No, I don't think so. Once again, I think Galactus is Doomsday. Right. It's a Doomsday story when you get Galactus. Um, because he's gonna just eat the whole earth. So you don't you have to deal, you don't have to deal with a giant monster, you have to deal with Doomsday. I think that's a different type of story. Right. If it takes place a uh, hundred years in the future, what type of story is it going to be? A twenty ninety nine story. All right, I'm not as funny as Chris. I, I admit it. <laughs> I, I thought you guys were sick of me saying it, so I, I know how to react. <laughs> Don't you know the rule of rule of 100 when it comes to comedy, Chris? Is it similar to the rule of 2099? <laughs> the rule of 100 when it comes to comedy is you and your buddies have an inside joke. You say it once, you say it twice. By about the 10th time, it's worn out. But if you keep pushing it through, and say it a hundred times, it becomes funny forever. You'll never stop laughing at it. That's the rule of 100 when it comes to comedy. I'm not saying it works in stand up comedy, I'm saying it works with your buddies. <laughs> that ending did tear me up surprisingly. I was caught off guard with the emotion it got liquid. <laughs> Oh, well, we should wrap it up now. This is coming to our time to end. We can make some uh, confetti. There we go. Some balloons. Some flamingos flying by. Will it do that? Will it do that? No. <laughs> that would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We have to learn how to code so we can put flamingos and flying pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have yours turned on, uh, Wilson? No, I haven't figured it out yet uh, where it has to be done. All it is is um, you're on your laptop, right? No, I'm when on my you're, desktop. You're on your, your desktop, whatever it is. Right. When you're streaming something, see how up in the middle it's got that little... Uh, um, what's well, Google Chrome? It, it's, it should have a little thing that says video on it. Mine says Google, that's not what I want. Oh, and what when you're streaming something in your Mac, something pops up. Let me see which one is it. I think since I'm streaming on Google, it's not popping up. And it, it, it it's like a you know what you do. You turn on when you're when you're offline, turn on like FaceTime or something. And okay. up in your menu, you'll see a little red light. And you click on it and you tell you turn effects on or something like that. And that's where this stuff comes from. By default, it's off, but mine got turned on somehow. <laughs> that's how I, we discovered it by accident. <laughs> see some thunder going. Let me get my Come on, you can see my thumbs, can't you? The two thumbs down is the hardest one. There we go. All right, any final words, Paolo? Nah, tomorrow I'm going to be watching auto racing. All right. It's the how weekend. About, <laughs> how about you, Chris? <laughs> um, uh, something 20 all right. Funny. funny. Golf clap. Golf funny. Clap. <laughs> Wilson, any final uh, words from you? No, not much. Uh, tomorrow, I think there's a like a outdoor con going on in Brooklyn. So oh, I think okay. I'm going to go check that out. Uh, from what I understand, it's like a one-day con. So that I'm sounds gonna, like fun. You know, so I'm going to check it out and see what it's like. If it's any good, maybe I'll display there next year. All right. So everybody have a good night, and we will catch you next time. See ya. Take care, everybody.